Assalamu alaikum to you all. Can you hear me loudly and clearly? Loud and clear. Excellent. Yeah, excellent. Thank you all for being with us and for being on time. Uh, we're going to ask our brother William Safir to open us up with Al Fatiha and give some opening comments. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Rahman Rahim, Maliki Yawmiddin. Iyaka Na'abudu wa Yaqana Sta'in. Itina Surat Al-Mustaqim. Surat Al-Aydina Anna Amta Alayhim. Qairil Makdubi Alayhim wa Riddu'alim. Saraka Allahu Adhim. Wanted to just share something with everyone. I, uh, there was a one of our sisters that uh, was expressing some some of her own personal journey and concerns on Facebook, uh, and uh, she's well I, well, I consider um, a thinker. You know, she's uh, she has has posted quite a quite a bit of insight on uh, from, from time to time. Uh, and uh, I shared this with her, you know, she was talking about how deeply she had been immersed recently in, uh, in her own personal development journey. Uh, and uh, so just to kind of give her some, uh, some support, uh, and possibly some direction. Uh, I shared these words with her, and I'm going to read it from you. Uh, the post, the post that that uh, that I made on on uh, on Facebook. Uh, I've been helped in my own immersion using the tools available in the science of nunetics. Imam Muhammad told us years ago that words make people. Nunetics allows you to scientifically look deeper into the words that have formed you while anchoring that search in the paper. The letters that make up the words are put under a chronic magnifying glass to uncover deeper insight and meaning. Uh, and I sh just shared those words with her. I didn't want to get you know, too too deep uh, because she seemed to have been in a pretty deep state already. Uh, so I, I just shared that and, and uh, inshallah, it, it helped her uh, get some direction and, and, and maybe she'll, she'll join us soon. And um, I'm, I've been sharing uh, those kinds of thoughts with, uh, practically with everyone that I've come into contact with in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and it just so happens that uh, I was in a company of uh, some Asians. Uh, one was from China, uh, Asian women, as a matter of fact. One was from China, the other one from Taiwan. And we were talking about finance. I'm a financial advisor and we were talking about finance. Uh, and uh, they asked me about my, uh, uh, my background, and I was sharing some of it with them. Uh, and and uh, one of them posed a question uh, to me, and the question was, uh, had I received a uh, spiritual awakening? Uh, and we spent half of the conversation, you know, uh, we switched from finance, we started talking, talking about spirituality, and it was pretty interesting, you know, coming from two Asian women uh, who were also financial advisors. Uh, but that's the time we're in right now. So we have a big opportunity uh, to share uh, the value of nunetics with, uh, with the whole world. I mean, people are, are concerned and interested. And uh, Instructor Bilal, she says she wanna meet, meet you and learn more about uh, nunetics as, as soon as possible. So, so she just wanted to share that with everyone. <laughs> Right, and we're thankful for you sharing that. 
That's wonderful. That represents growth for us. So we're going to be beginning in just a moment. Thank you to William Safir for that introduction and those uh, on-time remarks regarding the growth and development of this Nunetics method that more and more people are becoming more and more interested in. And that's a wonderful thing. We should have quite a few guests joining us tonight also. And if they're already in the queue, we welcome you and we appreciate your presence. Thank you for being with us. All right. Greetings to all of you learners, you instructors, your, you senior instructors and all of the guests that we have with us this evening. Thank you so much for being with us. I am your instructor for tonight, Benjamin Bilal. And uh, as always, I wish each and every one of you the greetings of peace. And it is the peace that obligates each and every one of us to keep the peace. In the greetings, salam alaikum to you all. <clears throat> Thank you all for being with us on the 16th evening of March, 2022. And uh, it's been a lot going on in the life of your instructor and I'm sure in the lives of many of you who have joined us tonight. And as the young folks like to say, believe it or not, it's all good. And those are words from the Quran where Allah says that Allah is khayr, Allah is good and he accepts only that which is khayr or good, beneficial is what that word means. So whether we're going through challenging times that challenge us in terms of our understanding, in terms of our patience, in terms of anything else that might want to make us, as Marvin Gaye said, throw up your hands and make you want to holler, you know, we have those moments. But at the same time, we remind ourselves and we ask others to remind us also that Allah is always and forever in charge. Whether it's humongous, whether it's minute, doesn't matter. Allah is in control of every millisecond of the time that we're spending, this precious time that we're spending on this planet Earth by the grace of Allah. So let us be mindful, let us be thankful, and let us be encouraged by that. I like to say about that word salam, which as we know, uh, generically speaking, means peace, P-E-A-C-E. I like to say that it is actually the human being's default system. It's actually the default setting for your nervous system. Whenever your nervous system gets out of whack or becomes disturbed by something that it's not registering correctly or paying too much attention to, the nervous system will begin to quiver like a bowl of water that was at first still, and then it becomes disturbed by a mere touch of the water by your fingertip. You know what I'm talking about. When you touch that still bowl of water, that water is so still that it has sought its equilibrium within the bowl and it is just even, the water in the bowl and the tub is just even, that is until you touch it until you disturb its balance. And the human being is exactly the same way. It's just that we operate on that level when it comes to our emotionality, when it comes to our nervous system, the things that touch us, the things that even disturb us or the things that might even bring us joy. They are still having an effect on the human nervous system. Salam is that principle of energy that Allah has created that is designed to bring that nervous system back to its original fitra-based balance. So we don't greet each other with that Quranic greeting, salam alaikum, for no reason. What we're actually doing is making a dua or a prayer of sorts that the human being remain balanced, that the human being remain uh, in a state of uh, peace and cooperation. That's what we're asking for. Every time we give the greeting salam. And if you look at even the word salam and the letters that are being used, you find that the primary consonants in that word are S, L, M in salam. S, L, 
M. And knowing what we know about the interchangeability of consonants, and also knowing those of you who have been in this course for more than a minute, which is most of you here tonight, you know that the letter S and the letter C are interchangeable. You can even hear it in your pronunciation, S, C. <laughs> they both have the S sound because in reality, there's no such creature as the letter C. That's one of those tricks of English the language that gets by most people because the letter C is going to be pronounced either as an S or as a K, as in the word circus. Huh? The first C in circus sounds like an S sound. And the second C in circus sounds like the K sound. So where's the C? There is no C, you see. <laughs> There's no real C in English. And no other language follows that kind of uh, breaking of the rules, if you will, except for the English language, because the English language was designed for a specific purpose when it comes to language. And we're not going to get into that diatribe tonight, but suffice it to say that when you interchange the S in salam with the English C, you get the word calm. C-A-L-M, you still have the L and the M, but instead of the S on the beginning, you have the C being pronounced as a K. Now, I hope that's not confusing to any of the new people, but it's easy to follow if you put it into your mind's eye. S-A-L-A-M becomes C-A-L-M in English, and it means exactly the same thing. When somebody says, calm down, brother, what are they saying? They're saying, relax your nervous system, <laughs> aren't they? Yeah, bring your nervous system back to its balance, back to its equilibrium. So that's what we're wishing on people. I want new people, especially if you're not Muslim, to understand something about what the Quran is intended to bring, not to Muslims only, but to humans, generally speaking. The Quran is not a book for Muslims in particular. Muslims are merely the vehicles, the vessels, and the tools that God uses to bring other people up to this level of enlightenment. And there's no magic words that will make you a Muslim. I don't care what you've heard. There's no shahada. There's no shahada tain. There's no shahada thrain. There's no, there's no muttering or uttering of words that are responsible for making you a Muslim. Only the creator makes Muslims. Imams can't do it. Muftis, sheikhs, ulema, all of them put together cannot make a person a Muslim because Muslim is not a religious title. Muslim is the name of your very human nature. So every human being is actually born into a Muslim state. But that state in you needs to be awakened, initiated, activated. Once it becomes activated through the conscious accepting by you of the information given to us in the Quran, when you accept that message consciously and begin to work on that message so that the message begins to work on you, then you become what's called a cognitive Muslim or a conscious Muslim, a Muslim who begins to follow the rules and the principles and the guidelines and the guidance, but on a conscious level. Everything in creation is following a guidance and guidelines unconsciously and even subconsciously, but the human being is the only creature created by the source creator who has the option of following something with his or her conscious mind. The turtle can't do it. The fly on the wall can't do it. Those things are pre-programmed instinctively to follow their particular set of instructions created for them by the same source creator who created us. But the human has been gifted, I repeat, with the ability to come into a level of cognition that surpasses all of the living creatures that we know of on this planet. 
And that is our gift. And it was given to us for a particular reason. And that reason will be seen very shortly as I go into tonight's discourse. So let me pull up my notes. Thank you once again for being with us and for being on time. The title of tonight's discourse is The Spellcasters Have Robbed Humanity of Their Excellence. In fact, uh, yes, okay. I want to make sure I had the proper notes, okay. And again, welcome on this Wednesday, March 16th, 2022. And all of you know that Wednesday is actually an off day for us. This would normally be happening on a Sunday evening. So those of you who have joined us and are wondering what happened, <laughs> we invited you on a Wednesday. It's because we didn't have class this past Sunday and we're making up for it tonight. So dear learners and guests, if this is your first exposure to information of this type, please be very patient with this presentation. We promise you that the more you listen, the clearer this message will become in your ears. Do not let the Arabic Quranic portions of this discourse frighten you. Arabic is an ancient Afro-Asiatic language which is connected to dozens of Semitic languages that were and still are spoken throughout Africa, Asia, and the so-called Middle East. Strap in and be ready for the linguistic ride of a lifetime. We're going to begin with a short verse from the Quran where Allah says, Lakad khalaqnal insana fi ahsani taqween. This is the transliteration of the Arabic words. And translated into English, it says, without doubt, we have programmed the human being in the most excellent of organizationally balanced designs. This is the translation of yours truly, in case you're wondering why you have not seen it before. Again, is translated as without doubt, we have programmed the human being in the most excellent of organizationally balanced designs. And we just got finished discussing that term balance in the term salam. So let's look at this. For Muslim readers of the Quran, I know you're familiar with the word khalaq. This na means us. So khalaq na means we or us did this. We created normally khalaqa is translated as he created a thing. What I'm saying to you is that I'm giving you the 2022 update on this ancient Arabic word, khalaq. It not only means created, it means created in a way where that particular creation has been systematically programmed by God. There are things that are created that are haphazard in this world that go haywire when they operate in this world. They are human beings who, <laughs> who are just ready for nutsville because their internal programming is not set according to what the Quran calls the fitrah. The fitrah simply means according to how nature has pre-programmed everything and has given it its marching orders. That's the fitrah, how nature has subscribed and prescribed its instructions into created matter. So what we're saying is that the human being has been created in the most excellent. Other things have been created in excellence, but the human being, according to this particular verse, it says ahsan, ahsan. That means it's the superlative of good. If we were to say good, better, best, as we do in English, this would be the best or the greatest or the most excellent of organizationally balanced designs. So if you find another part of creation 
that also is subscribing to a particular level of programming, look for what is keeping the balance in that creation. Take the tree, for instance. The tree stands upright. The tree branches out, as we know. And it's actually the symmetry of the tree's branches that actually keep the tree upright and standing. It's that symmetry. So the source creator has clocked balance into the nature of the tree. The same source creator has created and clocked balance into the movement, the uh, supposed, alleged movement of the sun. <laughs> we know something different is, different is going on scientifically speaking. But according to how we visualize the sun, it comes up in the east, it pinnacles up north, and then it begins to uh, experience a downward trajectory to the west. So when the sun reaches its pinnacle, that's its balance. It's created in a, in a, in a, uh, uh, it, it gives us a picture of something that is seeking balance. Once it achieves that balance, then it begins to set. And what this verse is saying again is that the human being's balance is even more precious, more worthy of observation, more worthy of study than even those other things that seek balance and achieve balance. The human being's nature, I'm telling you what other creature, what other creature achieves the balance that the human being has been blessed to achieve? The human being I'm saying is a very, very precious creation. And when I say human being, I'm not talking about the black man. And I certainly am not talking about the white man. When I say human being, I'm talking about all people, males, females, teenagers, children. And I'm telling you just reviewing how babies come into this world because uh, one of our daughters just had a newborn and just to watch the baby's actions and activities, not being able to verbalize, but being able to open eyes and look into your eyes. I'm telling you, if you have never experienced what it's like to be connected to your source creator energy wise, it means you've never looked into the eyes of a newborn infant. And I'm saying that as the male, I can imagine how the females feel about it, especially if you're a mother or have been a mother. So these are a part, these are parts, pardon me, of the excellence that the source creator has actually clocked into the human nature. And we need to seriously appreciate that. We're still talking about balance. We're talking about organization. The human being is an organized creature. Don't think of yourself as a human being based on what you see in the mirror every morning. When you look at your body in the mirror, that's not you. That body, this body, these eyes, this nose, this mouth and this skin color, this is constantly changing. And as I advance in years, it's going to be changing probably um, in a way that makes it weaker, not as fit, et cetera. But what's happening inside of me can be doing the exact opposite. It can be increasing in value, increasing in worth and increasing even in strength and conviction as they call it. So the true human within you is what is being addressed in this term, el insan. You see it there? Laqad khalaqna al insan. That's what's being translated as the human being, but it has not a nothing zippo zilch to do with this flesh and blood stuff that you look at in the mirror every morning. You could lose an eye, an arm, a leg, or whatever, you know gastric bypass, he takes stuff out of you, throw it away, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> but that has nothing to do with the true you within. And the reason why many of us fall into depressed modes, the reason why many of us fall into uh, states of regression even, because what we're deeming to be real life is just too much for us. It's because of the upset in the balance in terms of how we think about ourselves as humans.
we tend to judge ourselves by these physicalities, by how we look or how we don't look, how beautiful we are, or how ugly we think we are, or what somebody said about us being too ugly for them or not being whatever wealthy enough or not living in the right neighborhood. And, you know, we take all of these physical things and we begin to judge our vital life based on these physical things. And we're actually bypassing the single most important aspect of what makes us human. And that is the internal self called the soul, called the nafs in the Quran, N-A-F-S. In English, they translate it as soul, S-O-U-L, although it means much more than that. We'll get into some of that discussion tonight. Now this word that's being used in Arabic to begin this sentence, lakad, is what we're going to discuss right now for just for a moment. Again, if you're not a speaker of Arabic, you're not familiar with the Quran, worry not. Just be patient and listen carefully. I guarantee you that you're going to walk away with some benefit in terms of this information. Lakad carries the lamb and lamb is the Arabic letter L. Hmm? Lakad carries the lamb, that's this L right here that begins the word. And it's called the lamb of intensity. And it deepens the meaning of the word that is attached with it, which in this case is the word God. So if you look at the word la, God, this la is the lamb of intensity and it is intensifying or making deeper the meaning of the word God, K-A, pardon me, Q-A-D. Now, what does God mean? God means surely. Listen carefully. God means surely. And is a reference to something that will take place in the future. When you see the word God in the Quran, God, the believers will eventually win through. They translate that. What is making it mean eventually? God having to do with something that will take place in the future. However, although we are to visualize it, pardon me, although it's, it's going to take place in the future, we are to visualize it as having already happened. I want you to follow this. That's why I'm going as slow as I'm going. When Allah uses the word God, I repeat, is speaking to something that will take place in the future. Although in our mind's eye, we're to visualize it as though it has already taken place. You know how when you're so sure of something that somebody's asking you to do, you're so sure that you're capable of doing it, that you say, done deal. Hmm? Hey man, I need somebody to help me drive cross country. Yo, I'm your man, brother. Really? Yeah, man, look, done deal. Now, it's not a done deal. You didn't do it yet. <laughs> but in your mind's eye, yeah, it's already done. Because you know what you're capable of. And Allah knows what the human being is capable of. So when he says, God, Allah is saying, go ahead and pursue that. Because I've already clocked it into the narrative for you to be successful at that. Isn't that beautiful? It hasn't happened but you're visualizing it as though it has already happened. Now the word Allah God, when you connect the lamb of intensity, this L of intensity, which is intensifying the meaning of what I just gave you for God. It suggests not only that it will happen in the future, but that it has happened in the past and was always the case for the thing being spoken of. Let me simplify this for you. You have God, it's going to happen in the future, but I'm to see it up here mentally as though it's already a done deal, but it, it hasn't happened. In the case of love God, what it is saying is that, I'm sorry, we're letting a few more people into the class. One more. In the case of love God, 
not only is it going to continue to happen into the unforeseeable future, but Allah is saying with the Allah part of Lakad, the lamb of intensity, that it has happened, not just in your mind, but this was the case for this particular thing being spoken of all of the way back into the unretrievable past. Whatever Allah is about to say with this lock God in front of the sentence, it means not only will this be the fact from here on in, this was always the fact from time immemorial. Isn't that wonderful? All right. So in this case, what is being spoken of is the human being's excellence. Look at it. Without doubt, we have program the human being in the most excellent of organizationally balanced designs. That means that the human being did not just become organizationally balanced. The human being did not just become excellent. We were excellent on other levels of performance in history. We might not have been excellent in terms of city building or pyramid building or you know, that kind of thing. These kinds of progressions happen uh, sporadically throughout history. But it's not talking about your external material accumulation and performance. And in San, I repeat, is talking about a particular level of performance that is taking place inside of you. See? mentally, morally, spiritually, emotionally. That's where the balance is. And what Allah is saying with this particular verse is that he created the human being from the very inception to reflect levels of balance on all of those important internal invisible levels. And the, you know the way to verify that? Just look at any newborn baby. You see that peace? You see that balance in their nature? You see them struggling for balance when they finally learn how to stand up and move those legs forward? He's struggling for that balance because that balance has been clocked into her and him by the source creator of all. You think that's a book just for Muslims that we're talking about? Man, those Muslims better get it together or leave it alone. <laughs> If they don't want this Quran, it'll be gone. <laughs> Jackson 5 was trying to tell them about it some years ago. <laughs> Get it together, Muslims, because there's a whole host of humans coming behind your foolishness that is going to inherit your Quran. I, I didn't mean to start that kind of trouble this early. Let me keep going. So again, this is saying that excellence has been a part of human existence for as long as humans have been in existence. And again, those of you who are foolish enough to attribute this excellence to a particular so-called race of people, beginning with yourselves and what the black man has done in history and nobody has surpassed the black man and, the, the, and we built the pyramids and, you, and the, you know, and the first skyscrapers and the, yeah, okay, you might've done all of that externally. What's happening internally though? Because some of those same black faces were, were some of the fiercest of pharaohs in Egyptian history. And in other places around the world, we can name people as black as your black shoe who were ruling unfairly on this earth. So we're not here to play skin color games. We're here to talk about human excellence. And those same African stock people who may have been failing in one area of the human development, they were excelling in other areas of that human development. The same so-called white man who was terribly failing in his relationship to people outside of his ethnic group, he was making all kinds of progress in other areas, especially the intellectual area of his growth and development. And when he found something was not any longer befitting as an idea in his mind, he would excuse that and accept the newest set of information. And he would build on that information. 
This is the kind of progress that human beings make that only the source creator can clock in terms of its progress. You're still seeing the white man as the devil. You're still seeing the white man was our slave master. You're still seeing the white man is in charge of the whole world. And you're so busy looking at the physicality, so busy looking at the external, which you think is reality, <laughs> that you're missing the whole point. The internal world of humans have, has been evolving for decades and hundreds of years now, just right here in this country not to mention the rest of the world, the world. What do you think Allah means when he opens up the Quran by telling you that he is Rabbil Alameen? He is the creator, the evolver and the sustainer of all systems of knowledge of all the worlds of all, of everything. Allah has his evolving touch upon everything that he has created. So who are you to upset the evolutionary power that Allah says is his and that affects every single thing that he brings into existence? What are you saying? He can't do it with the white man or he can't do it with the niggas? <laughs> Some of you are saying, yeah, no niggas involved evolving into that. You're missing the whole point because you're not looking at people correctly. You took a snapshot of where you were in the 40s or the 70s and or some bad incident or something that may have happened to you because of some altercation with a white policeman or whatever you know maybe you're back from the kkk days and you got that thing just ringing through your head and many of you do but you took a snapshot of it and you're living by the snapshot instead of recognizing that life is a running video and sometimes in the middle of the movie the hero gets chased up the tree by the dogs. That's the hero up there. Looks like there's no way out. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, somebody throws some dog food out there. The dog, dog rah, 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 rah. Yeah, he's able to get down out the tree and go on about his business and save the day. That's how a lot works. So yes, as a people, we were up the tree with dogs all around us, not knowing who or what to trust. But then all of a sudden, you need to study movie making. It's, there's a science there. All of a sudden, something happens. And the bad guy is caught off guard. And the good guy is able to save the day. That's where we are right now in the history and progression of the so-called African-American people in this country, alongside the European-American in this country, who are now alongside other ethnicities that are coming into the country, whether you agree with the way they're coming or not, yes, and everything is, is in Allah's hands. We don't sweat, we don't worry about these things to that degree. We have to stand back sometimes and look at it. And you have to look at it through the Quranic eye. Stop looking at it through your eyes and through your hurt and pain and through your personal experiences with people. Look at it through the Quran's eye. The Quran has a single eye also, you know, not just the Illuminati. The Quran has, I know Yaqeen is called the eye of the single eye of certainty spoken of in the Quran. All Satan does is try to emulate and copy what Allah has done. Now we're going to talk about the word excellence. That's E-X-C-E-L-L-E-N-C-E -E -E -E, for those of you on the phone. The word excellence is a reference to that which exits the cell. The E-X on excellent means to exit or to leave. So excellence is a reference to that which exits the cell, in other words, that which comes out of the cell. The cell has all of the necessary electromagnetic components responsible for their, uh, pardon me, responsible for the creation. Let me read that again. The cell has all of the necessary electromagnetic components responsible for the procreation and continuation of a balanced life form. When you violate nature's balance, i.e. the fitra, 
you suffer the unfortunate consequences. This has nothing at all to do with whether or not we are morally good people and has everything to do with violating not only social intelligence, but more importantly, cosmic intelligence. So when people begin to speak out against the so-called gay agenda or lesbian or whatever the letters are now that they've chosen and people say, oh, well, that's against nature, that's against God. And people don't always express these grievances and these ideas in a way that is best suited to address the real issue. The real issue is not that these are bad or evil people, see, and this is how they've been painted. These are bad or evil people, no. These are people who many feel are violating the principles and mores related to not your law, but the fitra and its law. What is the Fitra's law? The Fitra demands that creation in order to move forward must move forward based on a platform of electromagnetic operations. What does that mean? It means what the Quran says in simple terms that Allah has created everything in noble pairs. Zaljain, the word Zalj means uh, complementary pairs, which means what? That those two are not going to be exactly alike. If they were exactly alike, they could not procreate, they could not reproduce, they could not replicate themselves and therefore not replicate the plan of the creator who planned that copulation, that coming together, that replication, that duplication, and that ongoing development into the future. It's based on creative principles, not moral principles. Creation is not based on mor morals or something that humans made up. When prophets and messengers come to this earth to teach, they're not teaching moral principles. If they were, they'd have to teach a different set of principles based on the particular people and the land and the mores that those people have accepted as their life's platform. They'd have to do something different in Mexico than they would do in Guatemala or in, uh, you know, wherever else they find themselves because the mores change. People's idea of what is right and wrong based on their individual circumstances and situations, those things change. So morals are what humans invent. But there is a cosmic principle at work at all times that is advancing the program of things that are operating on that Sao Jin principle, the principle of complementary pairs. You see the DNA, RNA, those are complementary pairs, masculine, feminine, complementary pairs, young and old, complementary pairs, east and west, everywhere you look, you're going to find it because again, Allah says he created everything. The only thing that does not exist in pairs is the source creator. And I hesitate to say himself because the creator is not a him per se and is not a her per se, but is the creator and progenitor of both sides of the scale and can encompass the principles and the operating, uh, uh, we'll still say principle, the operating principles of both genders. So we say that Allah has masculine ways of doing things and Allah also has the feminine touch. Okay? He has a Rahman that can pronounce judgment that can bring something immediately to task. And then he also has a Rahim. I'm saying he, but excuse me because the English language is so limited. We don't have a word for this neutral positioning that Allah truly is. So he's our Rahim. And in the way that he handles creation, the way that he forgives, the way that he uh, redeems human life and brings it back into the fold unmolested, 
So Allah shows forth both the masculine attributes of behaviors, if you will, as well as the feminine aspects of behaviors, again, if you will. So we're talking now about excellence. And we're talking about not violating the cosmic principles related to that excellence as it manifests via an electromagnetic universe. Not country, not city, not state. Universe. The universe is electromagnetic operating upon those principles. And if those principles become violated, I repeat, that particular aspect of creation will cease to be. And this is not a rant against our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters and community for this is not a rant against them. If you're understanding what I'm saying, yeah, you'll understand what I'm saying if you listen to what I'm saying with a sober ear. Your sober ear knows this language. Your heart knows this language. There's not a person sitting in front of their computer now or listening to their phone who does not have a gay or lesbian family member that they can literally reach out and touch during the family reunion during any given year. And we don't hate them. That's as silly as the white man hating the black man because of his skin color and put the word so-called on the beginnings of white and black. We don't like that language. It's offensive to human intelligence to call people black and white and brown and yellow people and all of that. That's foolish, childish talk. Crayon colors for people. That's crazy. They don't even refer to their dogs like that. If they're telling you about a black dog, they say, I have a black shepherd. I have a brown retriever. They have names even for their dogs when it comes to people. Oh, yeah, yeah, black. He black. Describe him. He black. Really? And then the foolish thing about it is that when you put a black crayon up to his face, he ain't even black. You put a white piece of paint or something, piece of paper up to his head, to his face, he ain't even white. That's how, oh, we're going to be talking about spell casting today. I'm glad I'm leading into it based on this conversation here right now. Because the reasons we call people black and white who are not truly black and white is because we have been under the auspices of the most sophisticated spell casting system that the world has ever seen. I'm talking about this one right here today, 2022. The most sophisticated program for deprogramming your excellence that this world has ever seen. You don't want to go nowhere tonight. Make yourselves comfortable. So what does excellence mean according to the online etymology dictionary? And etymology simply means the study of word origins, where words actually come from, from their inception is what we're talking about. This is not Webster Dictionary talking to you. This is the etymology, the study of true words and where they come from. That's what this dictionary is that you're looking at. So excellence is from the mid 14th century. And it refers to superiority, greatness, distinction. Remember Allah said, we are asani taqween. We are the most excellent of organizational designs. And it means exactly this. This is the creator telling us about ourselves. We have a superiority, but it's not to be um, lorded about. It's not to be shown off I'm superior it's not that kind of superiority it just means that you're super duper in certain areas of what you can do you have a greatness and you have a distinction as a human being you have a mind that other creatures don't have a rational perception of things so that you can implement the good things that you've established as being worthy and beneficial for human life that's your excellence so it means superiority in that regard. Alhamdulillah, many people joining us tonight. This is beautiful. 
So it means to surpass. Do you know that the human being has clocked into him and her the ability to surpass even themselves? Remember Michael Jackson? He put out an album off the wall. He sold so many millions of copies and then he sat around and nobody came close to that uh, number of sales. He wanted to surpass himself. Isn't that beautiful? He said the next the next album I make, I want it to be 300 million more albums than off the wall. So and when I record a thriller, you know what he said? He wrote it on his mirror. What was he doing? He was using the God principle. I see it in my mind's eye. It's, it's not here yet, but it's a done deal. So that's what excellence is. It's the ability to surpass, to rise, to be eminent, hmm? to rise high like a tower, to be prominent like a hill. It's beautiful. The human cell has been designed by our source creator with a protective outer coating called a mem brain, which allows for nutrition to enter the core of the cell, i.e. the DNA. That's what's in the core of every one of your human cells. And you have about 300, I believe they say trillion. I may be incorrect. I will correct it if that's not correct. But I believe the human being begins as a unicell, one cell, then it splits to become dipole and you know and then three and then, and then it grows and grows and grows to become millions and at least billions of cells it might be 300 but i think it's 300 trillion cells in this one adult body if i'm not mistaken if i'm mistaken i'll just do what most of us do and just say it's a lot a lot of cells in this body <laughs> all right so the DNA is what is contained within the core of the cell and the membrane outer coating of the cell is what is protecting the cell by shutting out elements which will damage and or threaten the cell's existence. This is so beautiful. That means that when an outside enemy or elements that don't, uh, that don't show compatibility with the cells functioning. When that element comes towards this cell, the cell automatically tightens up on its membrane. It closes in so that that foreign substance cannot penetrate. Listen to this carefully. This is science 501 right now. That foreign invader starts coming towards the cell. The cell that is normally open and taking in nutrition, right? Feed, 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 feed me, feed me, see more. Right? It's the cell, right? And here this foreign object comes as soon as the cell detects it, the cell closes in so that it cannot penetrate. It has to go through a lot of bombardment to be able to bypass that cell's membrane. Man, I wish we had brains like that. The membrane has a brain that won't allow foreign stuff into it. I sure wish the human being had a brain that wouldn't allow foreign ideas into it. We, we'd be experiencing true Alice Long now if we had a brain that did not allow foreign substance to enter it. <laughs> We got a little dose of Arab Islam, and now we're, oh man, we're in sandals in December. We're going to fix it, though. That's what we're here to talk about. This is all a part of the spellcasting that I'm introducing you to tonight, my folks. We are like this because spells have been cast. No joke. So what happens when the cell has to close in to protect itself against outside agitation? What happens when the cell does that? It then has to draw its energy. It has to corral or marshal its energy around the threat. 
And therefore, very vital areas of the body has to shut down. And it has to shut that energy for fight or flight that is being experienced by the cells because of this foreign invader, this foreign attack the rest of those cells in that area have to shut down and they have to draw energy from other parts of the body that would normally be doing other normal and natural things like your immune system. That's one of the of main parts of the body that has to shut itself down in order to allow that energy to be shunted away from its development towards the threat. It's like the army being called when there's a threat. The country has to shut down for a little while. You can't do all of the things you enjoy doing until the threat has been dealt with. Your body, they learn that from studying the human body. They learn warfare from studying the human body, the white blood cells and how they react in times of danger, et cetera, intrusion, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, where is all of that blood energy being shunted towards? It's being shunted towards your fight or flight responses. Where is the fight or flight responses in terms of their location in your body? Fight right here, right? The hands, the arms, right? And if you perceive that you're not going to, able to win, be able to win this fight, then you flee. Where's that? in the legs and the feet. Hmm? So it's either fight or flee, you get it? So your arms, your hands, your legs and your feet get most of the energy, most of the nutrition necessary to sustain themselves during this threat because they have to fight or flee. But the rest of the body begins to suffer because the energy is no longer in place for them to keep up their production. Now, let me show you a very sophisticated scheme of Shaitan or Satan, as we say. We also call them the social manipulators. In this discourse, we're calling them the spell casters. The spell casters are a very important contingency of the overall body of social manipulators and spiritual manipulators. This is what they do. If they can keep you occupied and immersed in fight or flight responses, that means that you will become systematically weakened with time because the vital areas of the body that need that level of sustenance to stay in operation, there is a prolonged period now where they're not receiving the nutrition that they warrant, huh? Because all of it is going towards the fist and the arms. All of it is going towards the legs and the feet, you get it? That fight or flight response which is an instinctive response in all creatures, it is only supposed to last for a relatively short period of time. For instance, when you see the lioness in the jungle creep up behind the deer that's nibbling on the leaf and the deer's ear goes whoop, and then it looks and it sees the lioness and the lioness begins to run after the deer, trying to pounce on the deer, that deer is out of here. That's a fight or flight response. The deer knows intrinsically that she cannot whoop. <laughs> she cannot whoop the ass, excuse the expression, of that lioness. She knows, God damn, ain't no use of me throwing up nothing. I better get up and get out of here. Now, if the deer gets away, this is so beautiful in Allah's fit if the deer gets away, do you know that no longer than five minutes after the emergency has subsided, that same deer will then go back to nibbling on another leaf in the jungle or in the forest because its whole system has gone back to natural. Now, switch screens and switch scenes, leave the lioness and the deer 
and let's come to the so-called white people and the so-called black people. Now, there was a time in history not that long ago when probably the majority of so-called white people felt themselves to be in a position to just tell so-called black people what to do and when to do and how to do, or else you're gonna be swinging from that tree, Negro, if you don't do it the way I told you to do it. huh? We know that existed in this country, okay? So that was a period of fight or flight for the so-called African-American people in this country. And we had to stay on guard. You've heard the stories that your great, uh, that your grandparents, maybe your great grandparents told you about how they were growing up, maybe in the South, sometimes in the North. And these kinds of looming threats were always lingering and floating in the atmosphere. You didn't know where it was going to come from. Emmett Till, as a for instance, you walking and you're talking and you're a child, you're 12 to 13, 14 years old, you go in the store, you, you whistle while you work or whatever you're doing. I don't know what he was doing. I wasn't there, right? And all of a sudden, he's out, he's gone, he's dead. So imagine that idea crisscrossing the nation into the ears of so-called African-Americans, especially and just the fight or flight overcast of emotions that were dominating that brain and the brain of those people for how many days at a time, how many weeks, how many months, how many years, actually how many decades straight did we have to endure that? So what did that do? It kept the entire people in a situation of fight or flight, which is instinctive mode. And what happens when you're in fight or flight? The other areas of your development become neglected in deference to the emergency. So you can't build. You couldn't become sufficient in other areas. See the nigga? He just inferior, that's why he ain't got none. That's why we had to build a world. No, but the person, you were able to build the world by keeping us in a constant perpetual state of emergency. And the few areas that you let us into, we surpassed you. Unfortunately, it was relegated to the basketball court and the football field and that kind of thing. And even when we got into the sciences, like George Washington Carver, the original Mr. Peanut, we excelled. We, that's where our excellence began to show because you need freedom and you need that calm. You need that salam state of energy in order to begin to build. That's just the default setting for being able to build a life of excellence upon excellence upon excellence. We couldn't do it because of the looming threat that was keeping our instinctive modality in gear, waiting for the next emergency to occur. That's why we stayed so-called inferior. And what they're doing in this day and time when there's no more de facto slavery, no more Jim Crow per se, they're trying to invent a new Jim Crow, but it ain't taken. It's like a mess that just won't strike. They keep the concept in the media that there's so much racism and racism is back and white supremacy is we're rearing its ugly head again. And all of that is fake, phony, fictitious. Because again, they've been able to manufacture a snapshot from yesterday and advance that snapshot into the front of your vision today. And that's all you see is what happened in 1947, what happened in 1963, what happened at the uh, you know, Washington Monument. And that's all you're able to see because they're showing you a series of snapshots. They are spellbinding you because they are professional spellcasters. This is a powerful, powerful treatise that I'm introducing you to tonight. And I'm showing you how to get out of this, Malayas. You have to systematically detach yourself 
from this fake, phony, fictitious emergency state that media has put you into on the most part. Media has done that. The Magi, they were from a land called Media, M-E-D-E-A, in ancient Persia, where a lot of this BS got started. Now, that's how the cell operates. So the cell has to keep its membrane intact because the membrane is the cell's protective outer covering. You wanna know why you're being so damaged in history, so-called black people? It's because you are not knowledgeable enough to know how to repair your spiritual and intellectual membrane. Mem is a Hebrew letter, you know. Mem is the letter M. In Arabic, we would simply say meme, but it's the same letter. The Jews say mem, and the Arabic speaking world says meme. And both of them have the same meaning. They mean water. Water. So membrane is like water on the brain. <laughs> but it's not really water on the brain. It's having a water brain. What does that mean? Water has to do with moral clarity. Water has to do with that which is responsible for cleansing us and making us presentable to the world. Water has to do with the one substance that all living forms need in order to continue living, and that's water. We need it outside of us to cleanse the body, and we need it inside of us. That's the only substance like that. Now, you might need the potassium from a banana inside of you, but you, you don't take the banana and start washing your body with it. Water, I repeat, is the only substance where you need it inside of you for nutrition purposes and also outside of you for cleaning purposes. Isn't that beautiful how Allah has done that? So you need some water. And you need to associate that clean life, those clean ideas, those clean thoughts that make you presentable as a true human being on this earth. You need that in your brain. Your thinking capacity needs to be cleansed. When that happens, then you have the proper protection against any and all things that will assault you from the outside because it will automatically know not to let it in. Look at how many things we've let in through music. We didn't have this crazy music that long ago. Look at how many crazy dances we have. I mean, listen, there was a time when you couldn't get on the dance floor I'm talking about the, maybe the 50s, maybe mid 50s. If you were on the dance floor, you were never by yourself. Go back and look at some of those old dance, those black and white dance show, uh, uh, dance programs. The original American Bandstand and Teen Time, or whatever the names of those things were. Those people were always dancing male and female. I'm showing you their sophisticated science of manipulation through the culture. This is how they do it. This is how they suggest the next move on the chessboard to the people who are manipulating society. They say, make sure that we produce songs and lyrics that encourage the being together of the male and the female, dancing together. Hmm? Lindy Hop, all of these dances you had, you had to, uh, the, whatever, the tango, all of these dances you had to have a partner, right? Off that, I said. <laughs> you had to have a partner to dance like that. And then along came a dance called the twist. 
the twist. You think that's innocent. That's not innocent. It was from that point on that the social manipulators, the social conspirators, the social engineers that we've been discussing now, it was at that point that they decided to take what was intended to be joined, as Allah says in the Quran, and split them asunder. This is in the Quran. Allah says, cursed are those who split asunder what Allah has ordered to be joined together. You see that DNA? You see that twist? That's the twist they were after. <laughs> Yeah, chubby checker. You think that's an accident? They were playing checkers, my friends. And it was their move on the checkerboard. They do that for the small people. The big people, they have a chess board. They don't play checkers. They play chess. All right. So Chubby Checker came in and introduced a dance called The Twist that was the first dance in American history that you could do all by your lonesome. All by yourself. Round and round and up and down we go again, all right? <laughs> yeah, baby, baby, I love you so again. Yeah, come on, let's twist away <laughs> like we did last summer. <laughs> and like we did last year, you see. So they were introducing it gradually in increments so that the human psychic makeup would become used to the idea of doing things by yourself. But in reality, what they were doing was studying the scientific method for separating the electro from the magnetic within your very DNA. You think they just started tampering with your DNA with the COVID piece, <laughs> separating out the real RNA? You think they just started messing with your genetics? You're wrong. And even Mr. W.D. Farad peeped them and put it into his lessons. Talked about the grafting of a white race based on the separation of the brown gene from the black gene. He called them germs because all life forms begin with germs. The social manipulators got wind of that science and that's why they began a nation of colonies that had as its rulers, the germs called the Germans. You think they got that name by mistake, the Germans? You don't understand this scheme. It's very sophisticated. So the twist was introduced as a marker in history related to the manipulation of large groups of people who would become untwisted. The purpose was to take that twisted DNA and what it represents and begin to untwist it. Do you know that this scheme is in the Quran and the uh, mentioning of a woman who has the, herself, she's involved in untwisting strands. It speaks about her as untwisting the strands or the ropes. It's talking about your DNA. Do you know it's in the Quran in Surah Al-Fala when it talks about blowing on the knots? You know what those knots are? Still your DNA, RNA. That's what they've been doing all through the COVID stuff blowing on your nuts. You can be mad at it all you want, but you can't argue with it. And the Quran is so far ahead of human thinking that you certainly can't <laughs> say it ain't in there or it doesn't mean that because you don't, you don't know what the Quran means unless you learn to match up the wisdom with the wisdom. The word cell, C-E-L-L, is consonantally connected to the word soul, S-O-U-L. And all words that are consonantally connected share related thematic meanings. The theme for S-L sounding words, the theme is 
preservation of the integrity of something. The preservation of the integrity of something. A cell is preserving the integrity of the DNA. That's what your cells do. They preserve and protect what is in their inner core called the DNA, RNA molecules. And the soul, and you see how they call it a molecule. You know where they get that word from? From the Quranic word for angel, malaik. These people know what they're doing. Those are the guardians that are guarding the integrity of your cells. And you have the same level of guardianship, but on the spiritual and even the emotional level, when it comes to the guardianship over your soul, you have molecules also. They are spiritual molecules that are guarding and protecting the integrity of your soul. If you would only understand, you'd understand more if you just come on and join the pneumatic bandwagon. <laughs> Pneumetics is the science you need now, Muslim and other. You don't even have to be Muslim, just read Christian or whoever, atheist. Allahu Akbar. Man, you will benefit so much from pneumatics, the study of letter meanings. And then you can go into the Quran and you say, Alhamdulillah. You say, okay, hum, what is that? HMD, consonants. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, what does the H mean? Heat. What does the M mean? Water. What does the D mean? Land. I mean, you got elements in that word. <laughs> My, oh my, I wish you understood. In the Quran, Muhammad the prophet is called by his true name because Muhammad is his title. His true name is Ahmed, A-H-M-E-D, Ahmed. What is that? A-H-M-D are the consonants. A is a consonant, if you didn't know, it's pronounced from the back of the throat, ah. Ah, so what is that? A is air, H is the heat. You can feel the heat from your breath, that's the fire. M is the water, D is the land. You got all four elements in the name Ahmed. So you think you're reading about a simple Bedouin who lived in the deserts of Mecca, Arabia 1400 years ago, you think that's who you're reading about when you read the Quran and read about Ahmed and read about Muhammad, that title? You're reading about a language environment, my friend. You're reading about creative possibilities in terms of how Allah has mixed and matched the things to operate according to his will in this creation. And he has introduced these concepts through Muhammad the prophet, through Musa, through Isa, through Ibrahim, through Adam, all of the way up to today, through Maryam, and all of these other figures and characters and uh, uh, picture language that Allah uses in the Quran. For as long as you think that they are historical figures to be emulated and even worshiped, you're going to remain on the back of the bus of social progress. And you'll never get to where you keep saying you wanna go. So the SL sounding words, I repeat, have to do with the preservation of the integrity of a thing. So that's what the cell is doing. It's preserving the integrity of the DNA. What is the soul doing with this SL connection? It's preserving the integrity of our relationship with our fellow humans. Do you know that that's what your soul is designed to do by God? And even if you don't recognize a creator in your life as an individual, you do recognize social relationships, don't you? You do believe that you came from a mommy and a daddy, don't you? And they should have be, be given respect and honor and your siblings and all. You do recognize your social ties, don't you? Even if you say, I don't believe in no God, I don't believe in no Allah, get, ahead, get that out of here. You still believe that when you uh, die, somebody responsible should bury you. 
You believe that when you get pregnant, somebody responsible should be there to help you out. So you do believe that your social relationships are important. So you can have an active soul without believing actively in a God, meaning a creator, a force, a power that created you. So Allah doesn't, in his mercy, he doesn't stamp you out like a bug, you know, for just, you know, he doesn't do that because you say, I don't, I don't believe in you. And he can make you believe if he wanted to at any given time. And again, I'm using he very lightly. By now you should understand what I mean. So the soul is created for your social evolution and progress. Follow this carefully. The thing we call salt, that element, it preserves the integrity of meats. Remember the seafarers? They used to pack their meats while they were on the, the ocean. They would pack it in salt so that the integrity of the meat would be preserved for those long distances that they had to travel. You see, that's the SL in salt. Before it became something that you put on your dinner table or breakfast table, sprinkle on your eggs and stuff. Because that salt, I repeat, preserves the integrity of meats and fish that are packed within it. Look at the SL word salat, sometimes called a salat. Salat is preserving the integrity of our relationship with our creator, with the evolver, the nourisher and sustainer that the Quran calls Allah. See, so your soul is merely preserving your social relationship, but your salat, because you're not going to have an atheist who still has a soul, but doesn't believe in any form of salat. <laughs> He's not going to have a relationship with his creator, <laughs> see, because that's what salat is designed to do to keep you connected. That's what the word salat means. It means to connect. Now, the word soul is what produced the word soul shoal, and it is a play on the words soul shell. A shell is the protective outer covering of an animal, for example, which protects what is beneath it from harm. Let's look at this. Beautiful pictures. So you see the turtle on the left and these other creatures hmm, that have shells as their protection, the little Fibonacci spur on this snail, and the starfish, see, that's a shell that protects the vital life beneath it from harm. And beneath them all, we have the cell. And if you look at this strip, that covers the outside of the cell. That's the membrane we were discussing that is responsible for protecting that cell from any outside invasion or intrusion. When social engagement dissipates or is interrupted, the soul suffers damage and can theoretically become deactivated and consequently eliminated. Imam Warathdeen Muhammad referred to this possibility and probability. He said it was going to happen. He referred to it as, quote, the great elimination of the human soul. You may have heard him in a couple of his lectures. I've heard it in three separate lectures. He spoke about the great elimination of the human soul soul. Why does that happen? Because the protective outer covering of the soul, just like of the cell, is intended to keep out outside invaders. But if you develop a sophisticated scheme for getting past the security force here, getting past this outer layer of security materials, and you're able to make it into the interior, 
Now you got it. You know, when the Quran talks about the inviolable mosque or masjid, masjid al-haram, it's also talking about everything from the cell all of the way up to the earth itself, which is intended to be inviolable, not just a house sitting in the middle of Mecca. Are you crazy? What about this house? What about this bait? Bait al-haram, this inviolable house. You're not supposed to be violating your cell. Allah says, those of you who have accepted faith, your own selves obligate you. It's the same as saying your own selves obligate you. Don't you know your cells obligate you to keep them healthy? But look at what we feed ourselves to the point where we bombard this outer coating and it becomes too much for the outer coating and all of the wrong things begin to penetrate ourselves and that's why we're sick as a dog as they say in fact i don't want to even blame the dog in this we're sick as people who just uh, don't seem to have the level of intelligence to regulate this life correctly that's also what the quran is here for one of the first things we are taught in grade school is how to spell the purpose is to feed the student information that will be repeated perpetually in a way which allows for self-induced hypnotism to take place. Now, when we say spell cast, cast is to throw or hurl with force on casting the stones at the devil, right? Now, in this discourse, I will be referring to the social manipulators as spellcasters. One of the meanings for spell is story, saying, tale, history, narrative, fable, discourse, command. From the Gothic word spill, you can see the consonantal connections. It means to report. It's a discourse, it's a tale, it's a fable, it's a myth. Do you know what this word spell actually matches up with quite comfortably, I might say. Many of the meanings for the scholar-based concept of hadith. I'm not talking about the Quranic meaning of the word hadith that's given to us in the Quran to mean what is contained in the Quran, not the words of scholars. Hadith in the Quran is a part of the revelation. The Quran calls itself the best of hadiths. Asanul hadith. The most excellent hadith. It's in the Quran. It's not out here with Bukhari and the Muslim and these fellows. It's in the Quran. Bukhari and a Muslim and all of that and Abu Huraira and all, that came 250 years after the passing of the prophet. With the best of intentions, how can you trust word to ear to word to ear? How can you trust that for over, you can't trust that for two minutes in a room full of 10 people who pass a single message into the ear of the next person. You've done this in grade school. The message is gonna come out different and it doesn't mean you had bad intentions, but the message is not going to come out. There. So now how are you gonna tell me that over two centuries of passing down reports that they say are from Muhammad the prophet, that these people are gonna get it right to the point where we can put it in a bunch of books and then trust it like we trust the Quran. Are you out of your mind? And that's without calling anybody bad guy. Cause I got a few of them that I can call bad guys, even among the Sahaba. A few of them we can call bad guys in terms of their intent, their greed, their lusts, their lies. Abu Huraira was a known liar. That's in their books. And this is the guy we trusted to collect 700,000 hadiths. And this is the guy we trusted to, to, to believe that he memorized all 700,000. One man memorized 700,000 things that people said to him word for word, word? You Negroes of 2022, if you still believe this, go find something different to do than listen to us. 
you're wasting your time. If you believe that, I don't believe anybody on this call believes that, but she asked any event, it's on YouTube somewhere and somebody hears and oh, the, I still believe it. I'm talking to you. Turn off the computer, the, the internet and go find a Daffy Duck, Bugs Bunny type cartoon or something to keep you occupied. You'll get more out of that than you will out of this. We have to come into better sense in 2022. We have to, we must, or become a part of that great elimination of the soul that Imam Muhammad told us about. So you see what spell is. Let's look at the most important parts of this meaning. An utterance, something said, a statement, remark, meaning set of words with supposed magical or occult powers. A spell is an incantation, a charm any means or cause of enchantment. That is the same word that they introduce into the grade schools when they say, I'm going to begin teaching your children and I'm going to begin by teaching them how to spell. You think I'm exaggerating, don't you? Or you think I'm misplacing meanings for words. You don't understand this system. It was established by Satan but because Satan is too ephemeral, whatever the word is, too spooky, or I say social manipulators, you know, Tavik Institute, those, those kind of guys and girls. Tavistock Institute, go study them. Now, the word spell is also in the word gospel. And that's a word that was given to the Christians and they accepted it, not really knowing the full implications of what was being said. They were told that it meant God spell. But how much better is that if God is putting you under a spell? The Quran says, La ikraha fiddin, let there be no spell casting. <laughs> let there be no forcing. Let there be no compelling in the deen, in your orderly practice of life principles. That's what deen is. It's not just a way of life, it's an orderly way of life. There are many ways of life, but not all of them are orderly. Vampires have an order, have, have a way of life, but it's not orderly. Unless you believe in bloodletting, their way of life is not orderly. They will wait for you in the dark somewhere, snatch you up on a, a you know, dark street or whatever. And you know, when I say vampire, I don't mean the Dracula kind. I'm talking about some real vampires. Most of them are in Hollywood right now. Now, the English word spell is consonantally connected to the Quranic Arabic word asfala, which is from the verb safala, and I capitalize the three consonants that we'll be connecting tonight. The S, the F, and the L from safala. In asfala, you can see it, S, F, L. This is just the command form of the verb, safala. So let's look at what safala means from sin, the letter sin, the letter fa, and the letter lam. It means to be low, lower, lowest, mean, despicable, vile, base, inferior, nethermost, downward, below. I had to give my Melvin Franklin voice to give you the below. Safala. What does Allah say in the Quran? And pardon me for not putting this verse here. After Allah says, Lakad khalaqnal insana fi asani taqween, that most definitely we have programmed the human being in the most excellent of organizationally balanced designs. Right behind that, Allah says, Thumma radadnahu asfala safilin, asfala safilin. That thereafter, we have relegated him, meaning the human being, to the lowest of things considered low, asfala, see? Safilin, things that are considered to be low or lowest. 
thumma means after some time passes. Brother, now we have relegated who. It says, Radad Nahu. See how beautiful that is as a protection to human life that Allah did not use or choose to use the word al insan in that second part of the discourse. In the first part, he used al insan because he was associating the human being with his and her excellence. But in the second part, he didn't say thereafter we have relegated the human being to be the lowest of the low because the human being is not retrofitted to be the lowest of the low. The human being is retrofitted for excellence. The human being is not retrofitted for sin to the point where we can say that the human being is born in sin and shaped by iniquity. We don't believe that foolishness. And you Christians, If you knew about your Bible, what I know about your Bible, because your Bible was once my Torah, I was born into the Jewish faith. So what you're calling your Old Testament is what we call the Torah. So I know what it says, and it's supposed to say, and I know what they say it said that it really doesn't say about man being born in sin and shaped by iniquity and all of that going from the Old Testament all of the way into the teachings of the Greek-based New Testament. That's not what the Bible is purporting. The Bible is speaking to human excellence in the same standard way that the Quran is. It's just that the Bible's language is not as crystal clear as the Quran on that subject. I could show you from the word in sign that it's speaking to your excellence in two areas, social excellence and mental excellence or the excellence of the mind. That's what an insan means, insan. How many Arabic teachers can tell you that and break that down? I'll show you from the letters that the letters being employed in the word insan, in the word nas, in the word ins, that ns sound that you keep hearing, insan, nas, ins, that ns is representative of those two areas of your life, your social excellence and your academic or your mental or intellectual excellence. Noon represents your social excellence. I'll prove it to you real quick. Noon means C. That's one of the meanings for the letter noon or N in Arabic. How many people have you ever known to start a garden or even a plant on the windowsill with just one seed? Seeds are always distributed in groups. <laughs> the farmer, he's throwing them out. He's got machinery that'll throw seeds out into the field when he's ready for another watermelon patch. The seed in and of itself represents social engagement because seeds are always, the, you see the fish in the sea? That's another thing that the letter noon means. It means fish, but don't the fish and the shape of the standard fish look exactly like the shape of a seed? or essentially like the shape of a seed. Then your eye, the shape of your eye look like the fish and also the shape of the standard seed. These are instructing signs from Allah according to the Quran, but Allah says most people go on paying them no mind whatsoever. So the letter noon represents your social engagement. And the letter S or seen represents the engagement of your thinking mind. Seen has to do with the brightness of your teeth after cleaning them. That brightness is what gave the Western world the word sun, S-U-N. 
They got it from the Arabic letter Sin because they know that it represents brightness. But where is the brightness in terms of the human structure? It's in your intellect. You don't, you don't hear people speaking about somebody having a bright heart. When they call you bright, they're talking about your mind. So the letters N and S in the word insan and in the word nas, which is a word for humans, humanity. They're speaking to the development of your social nature as well as to the development of your mental capacity. So when Allah says, Lakad, that yesterday and into the future, we have programmed this guy, Al Insan, this social and thinking being, in the most excellent of organizationally balanced designs. He was that yesterday when history called him a, 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 a knuckle dragger. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the historian said, oh, well, man used to be what the ape is. We evolved from the apes. That's how you know they're liars, according to the Quran. And then there was the missing link. What, what, what missing link? You found all of that way before the link. And now you, you don't know where the link is that stopped that ape from dra dragging his knuckles. And you got all these other apes that are still dragging knuckles, but they're not turning into human forms. So did evolution cease? You have to understand where these spellcasters are. And they've been casting these spells for many centuries now. So no, you were excellent in your social progress and development, even if that social engagement was relegated to your tribe because you didn't know anybody. You Some tribe didn't even know there were people outside of their space. They didn't have the Tesla like you got. They weren't getting around like that with no city bus, <laughs> with no Uber. You know, they didn't know what was happening on the other side of that mountain until their curiosity. See, that's the mental evolution in insan taking place. When that began to prosper and push them forward and encourage them to curiosity go. See, Allah said He created us to be curious about each other, to engage each other. Who, who is he speaking about? And that's Ah, oh man, it's so beautiful. That was a part of your human development, is my point. Even if the human being and the neocortex had not developed yet, and it was only a primitive brain, instinctive brain, or complex, and a limbic brain on top of it, and the neocortex brain had not yet evolved or fully situated itself because Allah did not command it to do so. Then that emotional brain and that instinctive brain were the human being's excellence back then. He still had it. How do you know? Do you hear about any major wars taking place among these so-called primitive people? They're not primitive. They're just primal. They're first. The Quran speaks about the first people. They're in the Quran. They're the ones who said, we believe in the whole of the book. All of it is from our Rabba. <laughs> it's like the child saying, I believe everything my daddy say. You know, <laughs> saying he's the feeding source here. You know? But they don't know enough to know not to agree with something. There's not everything there makes sense. And everything in the human being's evolutionary track and trail from yesterday all of the way up to today, going all of the way into the future, it is an assurance from Allah that you're going to be all right if you follow the right rules. Now, Sefala to be low. Asfala Safilin. That's something that we become. It's not something that we were born as. 
And the becoming of that which is the lowest of the low is not due to your human construction. It's not due to you being born in sin in your flesh. It's due to your missteps in trying to figure out the way down the road and becoming awkward, becoming greedy, becoming satisfied with little of nothing to the point where your excellence becomes deactivated in you. So you need something to spark, huh? to spark that flame again. Spell casting, therefore, is the ability to cast someone, to throw someone into a situation that causes the person's downfall. Adam and Eve went up the hill first to fetch a pail of water. Pardon me, not Adam and Eve, but it's, it's the same story. <laughs> Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown and Jill came tumbling after. So the fall, the aspelacephaline comes secondarily, not first. Ain't no fall of man in the beginning of man's sojourn. Jack, by the way, represents your mind. Jill represents your emotions. When your mind falls because you end up chasing the wrong thing, it's just a matter of time before you will become emotionally desolate, emotionally misfit and unworthy. The downfall intended by the spellcasters is not necessarily economic, political, or academic. So don't look for the fall of man necessarily in those areas. Oh, the economy, oh, inflation, this must be the end of the world. No, the end of the world came before this. These are just some of the later symptoms of the end of the world. <laughs> the end of the world came when Imam Muhammad came into leadership in 1975. That's when the end of the old world of social manipulators began to become systematically pieced apart. How did that happen? Through the revealing of their schemes. Imam Muhammad, was he the only one? Heck no. There were many people whom Allah blessed and are still blessing to peep the schemes of Satan and present them to the public. Many of them are being shut out of social media as we speak. Nondescript people with powerful messages of reformation and reconciliation among human beings being shut out. People who have cures for cancer cures for leukemia and, uh, and if the medical industry finds out about it and how many zillions of dollars they're gonna use into the future if they introduce this cure? You mean cancer research and the billions of dollars they're going, all of that has to stop overnight. Once they prove that they have the cure for cancer, do you think they're gonna let that happen? Not under the social conspirators watch. That's why Allah is taking them out. They're on their way out. You and me, we just got to stay healthy enough. <laughs> and active enough in goodness in order to prepare ourselves for the exchange of energies. It's happening as we speak. We're in a new era. We are in a day in the judgment, according to Imam W.D. Muhammad. So it's not going to necessarily be seen in what happens to the economy. They have the economy on a, on a, on a uh, what do you call it? Uh, they can shift economic progress and economic demise anytime they get ready. You think it's natural circumstances that's causing your gas prices to be as high as they are and your electric bill and all that to be as, no, they are manipulating that system. Same thing with the politics. You think it's natural circumstances that takes one president out and puts another one in? No, they have been running that political game, that red and blue game 
for many years before any of us were born who are presently on this planet Earth. And for sure, you can't judge it by what's happening academically. There are so many PhDs and master's degrees being produced now that make your head spin if you knew the number. So it's not those three areas that represent as well as saffening. You're going to find this dissipation more or less in the areas of social and cultural affairs. Social, meaning how we engage each other, and cultural, the things that we let into our brains, into our emotionality through theater, through music, through common talk, through cussing and fussing. Can't even watch a good comedian now without him giving you the MF and the BI and all of that foolishness and males and females. And we're accepting this as normal now. And it might be the norm, but it's not the nature. It's not natural. They are bombarding your membrane, your social and your spiritual membrane, and they're doing it intentionally. And you are the only one who has the power given to you by Allah to withstand the assault. You see that word assault? The word salat is built into it. The A means not. <laughs> it's the A of deprivation. It's called the A-negative, the A-privative, pardon me, which means that on certain words, when you put an A in front of them, it deprives the word coming after of its meaning, like asexual, not sexual. A-moral, not moral. Hmm? So it's all a part of their scheme. It's all a part of their plot. It's all a part of their plan. Don't get it twisted, as the young folks say. They are manipulating us, I repeat, in the areas of social and cultural affairs. You will not find what I just gave you in the dictionary as meanings. However, you will find it using our system of consonantal connections. All words in English which carry the S P L connection, as does the word spell, they have to do with a downward trajectory. If I spill a glass of milk, it's coming from the glass downwards towards the floor or the rug. If I spoil something, leaving it out of the refrigerator, pastime or whatever, then the quality of that food takes a downward trajectory. If your computer begins to spool, you know what spooling is, right? What is it doing? Up, down, up, down, up, down. See, it keeps going up just to come down, just like Jack and Jill. And if I give you a spiel, my language in your ears is not that serious. It's less than or lower than me speaking to you as though you were an intelligent individual. That's high language, sophisticated language, worthy language. But if I'm just giving you a spiel, that language has taken a downward trajectory. The spell casters operate through the linguistic science of grammar. We've all gone to grammar school. I've introduced this before, but for the sake of the new people, this is important. What does grammar mean according to the online etymology dictionary? It means grammar, learning, that's what they want the common public to know, especially Latin and philology, the study of languages. But it also means magic, incantation, Spells, mumbo jumbo. You're seeing it for yourself, learners. Grammar means magic. So does the word glamour. It's the same word, 
R and L are interchangeable. So grammar and glamour, I mean, you wanna know why you have all of these glamour magazines? It's because they are putting the entire society through the culture under their spell. And they do it through words, the sophisticated usage of language. In the Quran, Iblis says to Allah that he will be laying in the cut in order to topple human excellence. In Surah 7, Ayah 16, Allah says, Translated, he, meaning Iblis said, and he's speaking to Allah, because you have thrown me out of the way, Lo, I will lie in wait for them on your straight path. Sirat al mustaqim, your straight path. Isn't that something? Now, this Arabic word, la'aqudanna, that you're seeing here, la'aqudanna, remember what I said about the lamb of intensity, that's what's being used here. So whatever aqudanna means, I want you to intensify it by the 10th power. It alludes to lying in wait in order to ambush. They do that during wartime, don't they? They over in the field dressed like a bush, <laughs> like a tree or something with it, dressed in green fatigue so they blend in with the leaves, you know. That's what this word means, lying in wait. And this word la'aka'udanna is from the verb ka'ada. Q-A apostrophe A-D-A, which means he sat down in private for long periods of time. Look at how Allah used this meaning to support this other meaning. Because that doesn't sound criminal. He sat down in, you know, like you do at home when you get home and you get comfortable and you don't plan on leaving anytime soon. You got some time to put in on that couch or on that uh, kitchen table or wherever. He sat down in private for long periods of time. The verb ka'ada also produced the word kuwa'id. Now ka'ada is one of the sitting positions in the salah. It's the second of the two sitting positions. And in the second position, you can sit there indefinitely. You don't have to be there for 60 seconds and get up. You can sit there, do dhikr, you can read the Quran after that, just sitting right there in that same God, that position, because you're in, no, you're in no hurry to leave. And that's what Iblis is saying. I'm going to be laying for the human being, and I ain't in no hurry to leave. I'm going to catch that sucker. I'm going to get you, sucker, as the movie once said. So that verb, God, that produced the word kuwa'id. Imam Muhammad spoke on this several times in his career. The word kuwa'id means grammar. Now, that's not what the word means in the Quran. I'm not going to get into that today. There was no grammar in 1,400, 1500 years ago when the prophet was having the Quran revealed to him. The word kuwa'id is in the Quran, but it doesn't mean grammar. They made it mean grammar. Who they? The social conspirators amongst the Arab linguists. You don't think they had them? Allah says to the Arab linguist in the Quran, woe to those who write the book with their own hands and say, this is from Allah. Woe to them. Hmm? And it says that they did it for a measly price, just for a few dollars more. But their few dollars tallies up to billions and trillions of dollars. But it's going to seem like just a few trinkets, a few pennies in the judgment when they see the punishment for what they have done to the language, especially the language of the Quran. So they have inculcated grammar, and I'm not talking about the innocent Arabic teachers and the Arabic professors, professors, so I ain't talking about those people. They have no idea what I'm talking about here. They are not a part of this scheme. I'm talking about the sophisticated ones who invented the terminology and handed it to the professor and to the school teacher, et cetera, to the Arabic instructor, those people. The words spelling and grammar 
are academically connected to each other. You don't think it's interesting that the weights and the measurements for things that you buy in the store come in grams? Who knows anything about grams? We learned pounds and ounces. Grams, they still have, so you have to convert it out of grams and they know you don't know what a gram is. <laughs> so that's why they put it, they were forced to put it, how many grams of sugar? Because they know you don't know how to convert grams into ounces or into teaspoons or tables, whatever. They know most of us do not know how to do that because we're not taught that in school. So that's a part of this spell casting also when it comes to selling you stuff that's not good for you. So where you find gram and where you find grammar and where you find grand ma for that instance, <laughs> it's gonna be something to spell cast you. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I ain't talking about grandma from down south now. I'm talking about the grandma that they, there's other Arabic words that mean grandma. <laughs> We won't get into it today. Now, the words spelling and grammar are academically connected to each other. The spells have been casted over the human soul and its proclivity for mental, moral, and spiritual excellence. That's where the spells have been cast. Not in the economy, not in the political arena, not in the school system per se but it has been cast over the human soul and its appetite for mental, moral, and spiritual growth and evolution. Now, if that happens in school, that's fine with them. If that happens in the political arena, in government, that's okay with them. If it happens, you understand what I'm saying? If it happens in the economy, that's good. They can live with that. But if there were no economy as such, if there were no governmental system as such, if there were no academic system as such as one time in the world, there weren't these systems, but there was still the cultural environment where people were thinking, people were making moral decisions and people were trying to become spiritually qualified as leaders in the community, et cetera. So that's where they aim their arrows. And that is what is being toppled and the major tool being used in the elimination of the soul is language. The word language is related to the word languid. Hmm? What does languid mean? Faint, listless and sluggish from weakness, fatigue or want of energy. This my friends, is what they have inculcated into the majority of words that we speak on a daily basis to each other, to our children, to our mates, our spouses, our friends. See, as soon as you go out and you say, yo, my nigga, what's happening, man? Yo, man, F that, man, nah, let's go see them bitches, man. See, as soon as you go out talking like that, you have been sold a package of languid, Weak energy, fatigued language. Soon as you get into an argument with your beloved and you start emulating words that you heard on somebody's comedy show to try to tell her off or make her look small in front of her friends or whatever, soon as she gets in front of people or he's in front of somebody and you like the dude, you like his friend and all you trying to make him look bad so his friend will look at you good, that's language, language that you're using. I'll go further than that. As soon as you have a newborn baby and you get in front of that baby's face and you still, oh, good, 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 good. that's language. You are setting that baby's mental faculties back for years when you do that. Talk to your baby the way you talk to each other and the baby will learn language much more quickly. Did you know that? Some of you did know that. 
But if you start that Google, then, then, then you start that stuff with your children, you are actively retarding your children. I don't mean clinically, psychologically. You're making them languid. Before they learn to speak, speak to them like you speak to each other. You should have been doing that while the baby was still in the belly of its mother. You shouldn't have been speaking to the belly. Yeah, when you come out of here, man, we're gonna, I got some business plans for you. You're gonna be my business partner, son <laughs> or daughter. Oh, wait. That's how you should be talking to your children. Keep these high concepts in there. And when they start talking, they're gonna give you back what you gave them. They're just tape recorders from one to seven years old. They're just recording. Recording, recording. So whatever it is you want them to know, if Allah has blessed them with that capacity, they're going to be able to capture that and raise you some. By the time they give it back, you man, I, I didn't, I don't remember teaching them that word. I tell you, I hear that from my children all the time. They're in here using language and working computer programs and all kinds of sophisticated. I, man, I was watching Flintstones. I wasn't doing all of that. <laughs> I was watching Popeye and Flintstone. And they in here with sophisticated gadgets and all kinds of computerized technology. And that's the advancement. The advancement is occurring through the genes. You know, Muhammad told us about that. He said, all you have to do is keep the language that I'm teaching you in front of your children even if they're not listening. This is me talking now. I say, write it on the wall. Words make people, man means mind. Make it so it's somewhere where they have to see it before they leave the house. That's how the, the, the social conspirators get them. They have the big old posters of stuff, nasty stuff, people laying and having sex and all that, posters of stuff, people kissing and, and whatever they're doing, smoking reefer, you know, all these posters and famous movie stuff. They got all of that. That's how your children, unless they're very strong children, they begin to want to emulate that. So put, put words make people on your wall. It's your wall. You paying the mortgage or the rent. If I had to, I'd paint it on the living room wall. But I didn't have to do all that. But if you have to, get yourself some paint. Words make people. Because those words are going to make them. And you're going to take them out of the direction of language language so that they can become a part of the progressive language that has been, that has become devoid of its weaknesses. That's what the Quran did for the world. It took the world out of its language, listless and lifeless language, and it brought them into a super duper charged, and level of energy. Now, in the same way that words make people, words can also break people. Words make people, but words can also break people. The most effective way of breaking people is to crack their social shells. The shells I spoke about earlier in the word social, social, the soul's shell. You got to break those social bonds if you want to break the people. Now we're getting right up to where we are modern day times. You want to break the human being? Break them through words. Break them through language. Nah, I'm not going to go too deep into it. I'll only say this, if someone keeps pushing the phrase, get the jab. Now this has nothing to do with the merits or the validity of what's in the jab. I'm not a scientist. <laughs> I wasn't in the lab. <laughs> it has strictly to do with the language. Get the jab. Do you know what a jab is? I know you do. It's a boxing term. Okay. The jab, it goes out first. 
you see Muhammad Ali and others, right? Joe Frazier. Throw that jab. Throw that jab out there, right? But what's coming behind it? As Eddie Murphy said, aha, aha. You know that right cross or that knockout punch? He's just setting you up with the jab. So could this possibly be what the social manipulators in media and in government and in uh, so forth? And, could that possibly be why they're using that level of language? They know language better than we know ourselves in some cases. So jab, 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 knockout punch, or at least a cross. A cross is coming. You know what the cross is? They put it in the graveyards, don't they? Isn't that what you find in the cemetery? You know what a grave situation is, don't you? It's an emergency situation. We spoke about that emergency earlier. Keep you in a perpetual state of fear. Trepidation, something's gonna happen. Somebody's after me. I always feel like somebody's watching me. You remember that? That's what they want you to feel like. Somebody gonna get me. And because you're thinking like that, all of your human power is going towards fight or flight and your immune system, sound familiar? Becomes weakened. I don't think I've heard one news report that emphasized the so-called building up of your immune system to fight COVID. I, I switched around to different stations. I didn't hear any, everybody's talking about, the, the, the closest they came is to say, try to reinforce the taking of vitamin D. That's about, that's about as far as they would go. Other than that, it was the jab, the jab, the jab, the mask, the mask, the mask, the gloves, the gloves, the gloves, antiseptics and spraying stuff on children and in their faces and all that kind of foolishness. But they didn't say anything about strengthening the immune system, not that you can. The immune system is such that it cannot be strengthened nor diminished, believe it or not. Yeah, you might say, no, I know somebody who has a weakened immune system. It's only because you're not allowing the immune system to do what Allah clocked into the nature of the immune system to do. There's nothing necessarily wrong with it. It's not a muscle. You can't strengthen the immune system. It's not, a, you can only strengthen a muscle. You, the best you can do for your immune system is stop doing those things that are interfering with its natural way of uh, helping you to stay alive. So it's all of the garbage we're putting in our system that is overwhelming the immune system. Nothing wrong with the immune system. It's just being overwhelmed. Stop overwhelming your immune system with the cigarettes and the alcohol and the, all of that other stuff, the foods and the fat back and all. Stop overwhelming with the sugar upon sugar upon. They done hit sugar in so many different foods, it would make your head spin. If I gave you a list of foods that you probably didn't know converted into sugar or have hidden pockets of sugar in it, starches and sugar and all of that, you'll find out that 90% of your dinner plate is sugar. So we have to fight back on the level of knowledge and insight, not fear. So I repeat, the most effective way of breaking people is to crack their social shells. You remember when they had that drug out here called crack? You think that was an accident? The fact that they called it crack is telling you something about your soul's shell. They've been after this. They've been on this scheme for many decades now. You remember they had something called an angel dust? Go study what dust is. Allah says he created you from dust to begin with. It's called Torabin. Torabin. So are they saying that they were going to regress the population to the point where you became primordial? <laughs> where you became primitive all over again? In your development, we're going to take them back to day one. Dust.
stuff that you particles that are in the air, but we don't pay it any attention. But we all get it caught up in our lungs, don't we? Dust. Dust is from the Arabic word dasa, which means he buried a thing until it became putrid. You know how you bury something? You go back, dig it up weeks later, and woo, woo, that's dasa. Now, the conspirators crack our social shells to the point where they become isolated from each other. See, we become isolated from each other as people. And that was a part of the scheme starting about two years ago or so. The word isolate, look at it. It's a cold word for putting the soul on ice until it becomes late, i.e. dead. That's what late means. The late Dr. Martin Luther King, it means dead. The word isolate is ice soul late, putting ice on the soul until the soul becomes dead. What is ice? Ice is something that you don't like to keep your hands on. It's frigid. There's no warmth. Human beings like warmth. Warmth equals life. Coldness equals death. In the wintertime, the leaves and the bushes, they die and animals disappear into caves and huts. Nobody wants to be out in all that cold unless you're a polar bear or something. So when you put something on ice, it inevitably loses its life force. That's what they've been planning for the human soul. Not for the, just the last two years. The last two years is just another advancement forward in their scheme. But they've been losing ground. They've been on a slippery slope since WDM has been on the scene. You can believe that or not. Or you just might not know what my references are. So I'm not getting into all of that tonight. They've been trying to light this match. We need more racism. We need it to be like the 50s again. Let's convince these Negroes that the white man is still after them. And then the black people will become the new racists. And they'll be after white people and there'll be crimes against white people on the subways and on the buses and on the highways and byways. We kill enough of them. We get the police to kill enough of their teenagers. We're going to make sure that black people, they're going to rebel to the point where they're going to become the new uh, race. They'll become black racists. They're racist and white racists in reverse. But every time you try to strike that match, moisture interfered. Yeah, some water content got in the way. I'll tell you the truth, they tried to do it through Minister Louis Farrakhan. Start a race war. They tried to do it through many figures. I can name at least five to 10 of them off the top of my head. Got your Al Sharpton, you got all kinds of figures out here that they've been trying to push this blackness agenda on us through. And these same people go back and retreat and they go back in the holes and the hubs and the cubby holes and all of that with all of their white companions and celebrate your de facto ignorance. Some of them go back and marry white people. White women in the nation of Islam. Oh, they got a white wife, Farrakhan, son, married a white woman. What? Now, I'm not saying this to take anything away from whoever you want to marry. That's your business. I'm just asking you, like, how do you explain that? So you're either going to be for real and come clean and say, we don't believe that stuff about white skin being responsible for a devil in the world? You're gonna reinterpret it so that it makes sense to us? Or you're gonna say, we made a mistake, I was wrong. I should have listened to W.D. Muhammad when he was my real leader. I'm lost now and I don't know what to do, I'm lonely. That's why he's craving to be in the company of Mr. Master Farad Muhammad. 
because in Mr. Farad Muhammad, Minister Farrakhan finds a man much like himself, alone. All of the millions of followers who love him around the world, he's still a lonely man. He's like the Maytag repairman right now. And if he was honest, and I believe he's honest enough to tell you that I can hear it in his lectures, he's lonely and he's frustrated. Because the match didn't catch. The social schemers who took over the world and have been operating over human life for thousands of years, they developed a method of inverting history, narratives, reputations, ideologies, and even religions to the point where the final analysis causes us to believe the exact opposite of what the reality actually is. One of the symbols which speaks to that inversion is the so-called Star of David represented by a right side up triangular shape. You see it here interlocking and overlapping and upside down triangular shape. The triangle is symbolic of the ancient Egyptian pyramid. What I am saying has nothing at all to do with anti-Jewish sentiment. I was born into a Jewish family structure. Many of you know that. I am speaking to secret symbols, which are manipulated to speak above the heads of common people. The Star of David actually has nothing to do with the religion of the Hebrews that are mentioned in the Torah. Those ancient Hebrews mentioned in the Torah, the Mogan David, which is what the Star of David is called alternatively, it has nothing to do with religion nothing to do with the religion of the Hebrews that are mentioned in the Torah. The star of David is nowhere to be found in the Torah or in the Old Testament translation of the Bible. In fact, the inversion, the swapping, the switcheroo that was pulled on the doctrines, the narratives, and on people's reputations has affected humans across the planet including Muslims. And you know that inversion of narratives and doctrines and people's reputations, that's been going. Right now, do you know they're trying to make the Nazis the good guys? Oh man, this thing is so deep. In this whole thing going on and uh, whatever, wherever this stuff is happening, <laughs> I don't pay it a lot of attention. Do you know that they have reports now in Western media that are attempting to make Nazis look like the good guys in order to make the Russians look like more of the bad guys. They will switch and invert the history and the narrative and they'll bring in new reports and dig up old fake history to support their contentions and to support where they want the world's minds to go. And they've done it with Muslims forever. During the Crusades, Muslims were the bad guys. When the sciences were being introduced into the West, into Europe and so forth, and Muslims were the leaders in the technology of uh, pharmaceuticals even, and in uh, all kinds of uh, medical procedures and all. Do you know that Muslims taught the European primal person how to be clean during surgery? Do you know they weren't even washing their hands? in these operations and whatnot. These Europeans, right here in this country not that long ago, the doctor would go from a surgery where blood is being splashed and all, all, all his uh, doctor's white coat and all. Do you know he would, with no gloves? Do you know that he would go straight from that operation or working on a cadaver? and not wash his hands, but go straight to the delivery of a baby. You know, that's why all of these babies were dying in Europe and in America from dengue fever and bubonic plague and all. It was a hygiene issue. 
These are the same people who would piss in a pan and throw it out the window into the water supply, into the river. And they were wondering why they were suffering from all of these major maladies in their European and European American history. They learned hygiene from Muslims. So then Muslims became the good guys, introducing them to the sciences and all of these other wonderful scientific developments. Now it's time for Muslims to be the bad guys again. I told you this at the beginning of uh, a couple of years ago when the COVID thing started, I told you the end result is that they're going to blame Muslims on the most part for all of the bad things that have happened in the world in the last 50 years. <laughs> they were setting you up with Saddam Hussein and uh, old Bin Salman, Laman and whoever. They were just, just to set, that's just the jab. And I'm telling you, repeating to you, the only reason that they're going to get more aggressive towards Muslims, I don't care if they call themselves Sunni, whoever they call themselves, it doesn't matter. The fact is that they want the term Muslim and the word Quran and the title Muhammad to be discombobulated in your brain. And it is because of what Imam W.D. Muhammad introduced into the world as Quranic logic. They figured if they could scramble the messages and make all of us look like the same thing, then people will mistake Imam Muhammad's language and logic for the corrupted language and logic left here by the so-called Muslims who thought themselves to be better than what Imam Muhammad had as a package of language and logic. They don't want Imam Muhammad's language and logic. They know it's growing in the fields amongst the economists and amongst the government people and amongst the even people in the culture of music and whatnot. They are these young people gravitating toward Islamic terms. Sometimes it turns out to be a 5% term, it turns out to be a nation of Islam uh, uh, term. All of that is fine. They see it growing and beginning to bubble and they don't want that. So the last stop on the oppressive line is going to be not only the Muslim world, it's going to be specifically and particularly the so-called African-American who has accepted, quote unquote, the religion of Islam. Because they understand that in the middle of that, most of which is being manipulated by immigrants at this point. And I don't mean that to say immigrants are bad people. Don't read me wrong. I got to teach this and I have to use certain terminology so that you will understand what I'm referring to and who I'm referring to. I'm talking about the popularized hierarchy of Muslim leadership in the world right now. I'm not talking about these scatterbrained ones who are just following what they're told. And that's the majority of those in Imam Muhammad's camp also just following what they're told by people who hated Imam Muhammad. But you go listen to them, you'll follow after them, you'll pray behind them, you dialogue with them, and you'll stand there like you might as well just be saying, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, when these other sheikhs and these people come before you with their dialogue. You better learn to get yourself an independent brain, like the one Imam Muhammad was trying to grow in your head while he was physically here. Did he make no mistakes whatsoever in his language and logic? Can't say that. Everybody makes plenty of mistakes. How many have I made in just what I presented to you today? I don't know, only Allah can count that kind of stuff. But he left enough jewels and gems for you to discard whatever it was his mistakes might have been and become rich anyway. Enriched and rich, literally rich. The new wealth is in Imam Muhammad's language and logic. And I might be the first one among us to prove that to you. Just keep your eyes on Instructor Benjamin Bilal and the people who are following this new Netics method. Just keep watching us. You can count down from today, just count down 365 days and watch what happens in those 365 days with this new Netics method as we're teaching it. You're going to see 
such a blossoming of intellectual growth and development established through physical institutions. It's coming through nunetics and those who study hard. You're gonna to have to learn to study like George Washington Carver studied. He got up at four o'clock every morning and went out to his garden and began speaking to his plants. And he said, and the plants spoke back. So if plants can speak back to the point where he can decipher it and understand it and use it to invent over 100 some odd new inventions out of a peanut because the plants spoke to him. You think I don't believe plants spoke to him? Well, then you should believe that letters speak to me because they do. <laughs> if you can't hear it, that's your problem. The person with George Washington Carver in the garden, they didn't hear it, but he heard it because that's how Allah communicates. You think revelation has ceased? There's nothing in the Quran that says that. That's because you don't understand what revelation truly is. The world would not have advanced scientifically, socially, economically even, if Allah were not still revealing. Revelation did not cease and the Quran itself represents a platform or a foundation out of which is to be established a multiplicity of sciences that go so far into the future of things to be invented, things to be calculated, things to be considered that our brains are not acclimated for right now because we haven't been introduced to the concepts. The concepts are contained within the word environment of the Quran, but it's going to produce brains in this world that are going to achieve so many different wonderful things. And that's how Muhammad of the Quran became referred to as Rahmatul Linnas and Rahmatul Lil Alameen, a mercy for all people and a mercy for all systems of knowledge. Nunetics just happens to be a system of knowledge. What are you contributing? And I mean that with the kindest of consideration for what you're doing. What are you contributing? Whatever it is, you need to let us know so that we can assist you and bring our contribution because we are a brilliant people on this planet. Allah did not do this for no reason. He didn't do this just to say, see, I could do it, but I'm not going to back it up. No, the inheritors who inherited the treasure beneath the wall, Ace, as Imam Muhammad explained it, those inheritors are going to go on to establish monumental things in this world based on the inheritance that they receive. My inheritance is pneumatics. I'm sharing that inheritance with the pneumatics learners and fellow instructors. They're sharing it with those of you who are new to the class, new to the concept. Most of you don't know what pneumatics is. Purchase the book. Learn it for yourself. Have it. Study it. Ask questions about it. It's the new kid on the block, as they say. And it is going to do some wonderful things for this academic world in terms of English literature and language arts. You bring your mathematical genius. You bring your political science genius. You bring, you bring, you bring. And let us build this world correctly. In modern times, the inversion that I was speaking about, turning something inside out, in our day and time, it manifests as these vestiges of racism, sexism, classism, and all other isms which pit electric principles against magnetic principles in an effort to get one group hating, fighting against, and destroying another so that the social schemers might prove their ultimate point. Now, here we are. 
Let's talk about that ultimate point. What is it? That the human being is not capable of portraying an excellence that will merit him and her reward from the source creator of all. The ultimate objective, my friends, is not to earn big bucks. It's not to gain political strength and superiority. The ultimate aim and purpose of these social conspirators is to prove in their private circles amongst their private audiences that God was wrong when he appointed this weakling, this sissified human to be the leader in the earth. He should have appointed us and our deviousness, our connivance. That's the only thing that can keep this world in shape and moving forward. They have to be dictated to. They won't come of their own accord. They have to be bullied. They have to be coerced. They have to be connived into doing the right thing. We want them to do the right thing. We want to save the planet, but we're gonna have to get rid of certain, maybe a few million people in order to, you know, have it the way we know it's supposed to be. Then we can go back to God and say, told you. You should never have put me out of the circle, Allah. I laid in the cut and I waited until my moment came. I sat in God that so long I got cramps in my legs. But I made a move. I busted a move on that human that man that's going to prove once and for all that the human being ain't worth shit. Excuse the expression, but that's Iblis's language. He ain't worth dung. He ain't worth doo-doo. He ain't worth nothing. So give the world to me. That's what these conspirators are saying now. The committee of whoever you call, you know, the Illuminati, whoever you think it is, the New World Order, all of those people, they're part of the same people. They're all the same group. I call some of them people from another planet because I don't think they're all from here. Imam Muhammad said that there are many people on this planet that have lost their human identity. And he said it's to the point now where we have to begin to separate real humans that are making true human progress from these other people. He said that when you meet them, you know they're not real humans. That's in his latest book. It's on. It's in the mail <laughs> on his way to you called uh, Follow the Leader. It's on his way to you with, with my new book, see? All nicely bound from cult to cultivation. The journey from Wallace D. Farrar to Wallace D. Muhammad, and this is book one. Another book is coming out at the beginning of May. It's already almost done, all right? So that's on its way to those who uh, paid for uh, semester 17 early. You can purchase that. I'll show you how to do it at the end of this class. It's only $25. So we'll get to that. Now, again, Today's time, the inversion is manifesting as racism, separation of the sexes, making one sex think that it's greater than the other sex or making both sexes believe that they are absolutely even Steven. You can look at the biology and tell I'm not what she is. That's why you need the Quran to tell you that and the male is in no wise like the female. The Quran says that very clearly. You're not what I am. I got this and you got that and you got those and I got. So no, your biology is called Zakr in the Quran. And the Zakr is in no wise like the Untha. That's talking to your biology, not to your internal self. We have to be Zao Jane on the outside of these bodies so that we can continue the species called the human species. 
two of me, the same thing, can't produce a baby. Two of you, the same thing, can't produce a baby. Oh, but we can adopt. Well, you have to adopt from people who understood the electromagnetic principle and got with the opposite sex. It's not really the opposite okay. sex. It's the See, that's what I mean by inversion. See how they sold us that term? The opposite sex. She's not opposite. She's compatible. The compatible sex, the compatible gender. So that troubling language is all throughout the language because the language itself has been made false. So that's due to the social schemers in trying to prove that ultimate point that the human being ain't diddly squat. The translators of the Quran themselves have participated in a sinister attempt to sully the reputations of humans, generally speaking, while insinuating that Muslims are the only ones worthy of God's salvation and forgiveness. This is my last point, and then I might have to run out of the room because some of you super Sunnis might be after me. Again, I'm not talking necessarily about anyone on the other end of this screen, but you never know who might show up to the party. Now, let me explain this. There should be and is a growing concern amongst the innocent and enlightened thinkers among Muslims and among some people who are not declared Muslim, who have written some excellent work on the Quran not to mention terminology in the Quran or from the Quran, separate from the Quran. And when I say on the Quran, I mean they have translators from Arabic into English of portions of the Quran done by so-called non-Muslims that are worthy of your time and attention. Think about that. The translators of the Quran themselves, on the most part, have participated in a sinister attempt to darken, to dampen the reputations of humans, generally speaking, while insinuating that Muslims, the ones who say, those Muslims, the Shahadatain Muslims, they have insinuated that those Muslims are the only ones worthy of God's salvation and forgiveness. You've heard this in your religion, Muslims. The only ones going to Jannah, brother, are the Muslims. If you do not confess Iman, Billah, you are not going to Jannah, you're going to Jahannam, you're going to the hellfire. If you befriend a Christian or a Jew, no good, brother, you're going to the hell of fire. If you keep that relationship up, you're going to the hell of fire. You married a Jew. Hell of fire. Well, what he's saying is that Muhammad the prophet is in hellfire because he married a Jew. He married a Jewish woman. A Jewess, they call them. The prophet. So stop getting your information from people who don't know what the hell they're talking about. Most of us do not truly know this dean because we don't study on that level. And we're very quick to seek the advice and the attention of people who have fooled us into believing they do, when in actuality they don't. So scholars from Mecca, from Egypt and from other places have sold us a bag of goods that have caused many Muslims to believe that we are the saved ones in religion. And unless you take that shahada tame, baby, you ain't gonna make it. Then you got others that say, well, some of them are gonna make it, but Muslims, 
will be the majority in paradise. There'll be a few scattered, you know, the Christians, you know, some Jews over there, a pocket of them, you know. But the majority of the paradise is going to be Muslim. What makes you so worthy as a Muslim to be the majority in paradise? Because you made extra rakah. And that's what they tell you through all of these false, fabricated, phony hadiths that all you got to do is say, subhanAllah, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, a certain amount of times, and your sins just start falling off. Say it a thousand times, say the dhikr, say the names of Allah, 99 names of Allah. You get to the 99th name and so many sins fall off. You go to the Hajj and all of your sins are left there. You, you go, you take shahada, everything you've ever done bad, murder, rape, incest, child molestation, all of that stuff, you leave it behind on the rug when you take shahada and you're not guilty. You don't have to pay restitution to anybody. You don't have to answer to anybody. Everything is forgiven because you said some magic mumbo jumbo. Do you remember that in the definition of spell? And grammar. I gotta talk to you hard like this because we're living in hard times and serious times, as Imam Muhammad said. This is a very serious day and time we're living in. There's nothing in the Quran that says that any number of anything that you do as a ritual is going to get you into paradise and have your sins forgiven. Nothing in the Quran that says, find it and email it to me. Nothing in the Quran that says, if I say this this many times, these sins will fall off or be excused. If I say a stock fit a law, stock fit a law, stock fit a law, stock fit a law, certain amount of times Allah will forgive me. If I fast during the month of Ramadan and I successfully fast for 30 days, all my sins for the previous year and all. That's no way in the Quran. The Quran speaks about Ramadan. Wait, show me that part. Where all of your sins are forgiven for, 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 for a ritual. Are you kidding? The only reason for the forgiveness of sins in the Quran is number one, if Allah wants to of his own accord, uh, that's his business. If he wants to, Allah is the doer of whatsoever he wills. That's the first point. The second point is that the forgiveness of sins, or let's put it in the affirmative and the positive, the accruing of barakat or blessings happens because of things that you do as actions, especially for other people. amanu, those who have expressed faith, and do good works, not rituals, amal, works, hard work, worthy works. Help somebody out of a crisis type work. Give somebody the advice, but not only just give them advice and preach to them, go show them how to get out of that turmoil. Coach them out of that bad relationship. Help them cement a better relationship between them and their children and their grand. Do something active. Spend some more time with people who are worthy of that time, who spent that time with you when you were in your diapers and changed those nasty diapers. You don't even go see your grandma. Oh, I don't get COVID. Grandma give her COVID. Pathetic. You know, nobody caught COVID from you yet. You've been in everybody's face. You in the mass yet? Some of you imams speaking through mass. The Congress, you only got about 10 people there and they all the way down the rug. And you got you there trying to talk through a mask and I can hear you huffing it. <laughs> and then some of you take it off and then put it back on to pray. What's the difference? If you had germs that were that serious, at attacking the person in front of it, them germs would have been out there and would have done their thing. So your logic is not consistent.
Now I'm talking specifically to Muslims. Your logic is not consistent. They haven't proven yet that germs will jump out of your mouth unless you spit on somebody. That's different. Then you deserve an ass woman. <laughs> but if you just talk, they haven't convinced you yet unless you write in somebody's face like that and you know, particles and all, maybe. But that's not how most of us talk to each other or to strangers in the public. Initially, they said stay six feet away from each other. You don't know their language. Six feet means six feet under. It's satire. You have to social manipulators use all of the time. That's how Imam Muhammad was able to bust them because he knew their language. Why not seven feet away? Why not five feet away? You mean to tell me they measured the distance of spittle? If somebody coughs or sneezes, they measured that distance to be five and a half feet before it drops to the ground and becomes ineffective. And if six feet away is enough, why are you still wearing the mask? So I won't be on this subject after today. It's really a waste of my time now, but there are still some, some of you who did not get the memo. The government got the memo. They know it's a foolishness. They're in there highfalutin restaurants and hotels having booty shaking parties with no masks on, celebrations in football stadiums and basketball arenas where nobody's wearing a mask in the audience, including the people who told you, you need to wear one. And they're having a good time. Going to get their hair did with no mask on. And no mask on the beautician but you still wearing one because you you so boogeyman afraid of everything that the so-called white man tells you, you supposed to fear because he's trying to keep you in fight or flight mode so that your immune system will fail. What is your immune system? I'm not talking necessarily about this physical one. We're gonna have a problem with this as long as we got this gut and this bad diet. That ain't his fault. That ain't the president's fault. <laughs> It's not Fauci's fault that I'm overweight and have diabetes and have high blood pressure and have all, all these other. We had that before COVID. It, COVID was a wake up sign that we need to get our health together. That's the good that's in it. Yeah, hey, man, we, we, maybe this is God telling us we had better stop paying more attention to our health. But the immune system I'm talking about is the one that when you connect the consonants of the word immune to the Arabic, the Quranic Arabic word iman, amana, iman, your faith system is your spiritual immune system. If you were Christians, I'd ask for an amen right now. <laughs> because amen is constantly connected to iman also, you know. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. There you go. Iman is your spiritual immune. So everything that your immune system does for your biology, your iman system is supposed to do for your spirituality, your spiritual self, that internal you that we started out talking about. So with that said, I have just a few more words to prove the initial point about how the human being has become subjugated and robbed of his and her excellence. All religions have purported this, meaning that the majority of humans are not worthy of God's attention. Only the smaller groups like the Muslims, God loves them, but he hates the Jews and he discards the Christians. They're still worshiping Jesus, get them out of here. And the Jews say, we are the only chosen people of God. You have to be born through the Jewish womb of a Jewish mother in order to be worthy of God's grace and blessings. 
And now they have behind that the same scheme that they fed to Muslims who are supposed to be free of that foolishness. They fed that stuff to us that unless you confess Muhammad the prophet, belief in Allah and Muhammad the prophet, that's just your Jesus Christ, the way they presented him to you. That's not in the Quran that you got to do all that. But that's what we're thinking because that's what we were taught by the social schemers. Come out of that foolishness. So we're thinking nobody's gonna make it into paradise except the Shahadatain people. And that's the way that Satan has of dividing up the world into smaller camps, sects, the Quran calls it Shia, to divide up the world into Shia and the sections so that they can manipulate you better. Now look at what happens. All religions, I repeat, have done this same thing. However, we are now investigating the manipulation of translations that are designed to count most humans on this earth out of the race for achieving human excellence. I'm talking specifically now, not about the Bible, not about the Torah. I'm talking specifically about how they have intentionally mistranslated Quranic terms. Here are some examples using the Quranic Arabic quote, uh, word akthara, akthara, A-K-T-H-A-R-A, -A, from the verb kathara, which means plenty, full, immense. Every time this word is used, This command form of the word kathara is used to mean something negative as far as the people go. A version of that verb is in the Quran in the word al kawthar And that means the river of abundance. There's nothing bad connected to that word. How does it become word, a uh, bad, part of me, when it's given in the command form of the verb, akhtara? Now, that word has been mistranslated to mean the majority or most of the people. So look at how they do. This is al-Baqarah, so are two I had 243. I'm only going to give you two or three examples and we'll be finished. Allah says, didst thou not turn thy vision to those who abandoned their homes, though they were thousands in number for fear of death? Allah said to them, die. Then he restored them to life for Allah is full of bounty to mankind. But most of them are ungrateful. So this is having you believe that Allah is saying that most of humanity are mushrik. Not mushrik. Are ingrates. Shakir, yeah. It's that most people on this earth are ingrates according to this translation. But this is not what this means. Do you think Allah would have a whole surah, the last surah of the Quran called that nas and say, The Rabb of Anas, Malik Anas, the King of Anas, Ilahi Anas, the so called God of Anas. Do you think Allah would have a surah highlighting the authority positionings of the Creator of all over Anas? If a nas on the most part was just this worthless, ungrateful group of people. We don't think like that. Let's continue. What is it saying? 
and we're dealing only with, but most of them are ungrateful. The true translation, and yet the people and Nas are not fully or amply thankful. Now, isn't that different than saying that most people are ingrates? The construction of this last statement is incorrectly rendered by the translator, whether it's intentional or not, if they are worth their salt as translators, they should have known this. And yet, the people are not fully thankful, meaning some of them are, but on the most part, they are thankful. They're just not completely thankful in the way that they should be. That's what Allah is saying. Let's look at a couple of more examples. This is from Surah 11, Ayah 17. Can they be like those who accept a clear sign from their Lord and whom a witness from himself does teach as did the book of Moses before it, a guide and a mercy? They believe therein, but those of the sects that rejected the fire will be their promised meeting place. Be not then in doubt thereon, for it is the truth from their Lord, from your Lord. Yet many among men do not believe. Again, akhtara, which they say means the majority or most. They're saying yet most amongst humans do not have faith. Yu'minun, they do not have iman. Most people on the, listen, People who document history will tell you that there has never been a time in human history when human beings did not have faith in a higher power. This atheism thing is a recently new phenomenon on earth. But it was not Islam. They did not believe in it. There was no Quran. So all of the people who came before Muhammad the prophet are going to hell. They have mistranslated and jumbled these meanings, even the meaning of the fire. It doesn't mean fire in the way we've been taught that it means fire. We're taking Allah and his messages, his instructing signs as something cheap by funneling them through these knuckle-headed, dim-witted scholars who pretend to be on our side, when in fact, they have entered into a cabal conspiracy to keep the bright light of the Quran and Al-Islam from ever reaching the total population of planet Earth. The people who put this together, many of the people who are running these schools and colleges and universities that teach this mess called Islam, They know they're doing the wrong thing. They know that they are misguiding the public because if you trace their history, this is my last point and I'll pick up on this next week. When you trace the history of many of these people in leadership positions in the Muslim world, you're going to find out that they go back to those groups of people who gave the prophet hell. Those Arabs of the prophet's day and time who the prophet himself had to almost cussed them out. Those people, they made a secret alignment with the Persians of their day and time. When Islam was being brought into Persia through use of the sword, which first and foremost is against what the Quran says, how you're supposed to spread the religion. You don't spread the religion through the sword. Allah said, La no compelling anybody in the deen. So how did they draw swords when they got to Persia and said, accept Islam or die? What's that all about? You have a question that Muslims? We have a long way to go, but we can get there in a short period of time.
if you just rise up. So understand where we are in this point of time also. We're right at the precipice, right at the threshold of something great. And we can lose it all by not acknowledging the inheritance left by Imam W.D. Muhammad's language and logic. Study what he left us, not as a worshiper of W.D. Muhammad. Don't be that stupid. And I'm only talking to the ones who, who felt what I just said. If, if you're not stupid, it wouldn't have bounced off of you at all. But if you are that stupid to worship W.D. Muhammad, after all of these years, and after all he's told us and worked against that, man gave up millions of dollars so you wouldn't worship him in that image. Lived in a small house, drove, drove a small, relatively small car, mid-sized car, wasn't trying to be no fancy nobody. So why would you worship him? And you have to learn to grow enough in this logic and this knowledge and this language so that you can give a speech and mention his name. Imam W.D. Muhammad told us once, and that's fine. But it doesn't have to be every other sentence. And if you didn't mention him at all, so what? Are you clinging to the knowledge base? And if Allah gives you inspiration, now I'm stepping on some big toes. If Allah gives you some inspiration, I know he's given me inspiration to say things that were not established in Imam Muhammad's language and logic. But if you are here to tell me and us that we cannot explore knowledge outside of the parameters of what Imam Muhammad left us literally as words and sentences and books and language, you're here to tell me and us that we're not supposed to explore anything else, you are a social conspirator and don't even know it. You're holding us back in the worst way. What if Imam Muhammad has said that about his father's teachings? I won't explore anything and try to break down anything except what daddy gave me. That shows that you haven't really been listening to his language. Because my language or the language that I'm introducing to you as nunetics, and now the nunetics learners are introducing the same language to the people that they meet and greet. It's just an outgrowth of what Imam Muhammad left on the most part. I can trace almost everything I say, including those letters back to what Imam Muhammad established as language. But I don't have time to stop in the middle of each discourse to explain that to you because you are insecure <laughs> where, the, where you're getting. You don't do that when you go to college and university. You don't say to the professor, hey, wait a minute, you're not quoting my leader. I can't learn this. I'm not, I can't study this with that kind of intensity. Where's WD? And that professor might be saying stuff that's antithetical to your very religion. Saying bad things about the prophet in the class in front of you, but you won't say nothing because you paid money to get that degree. So stop being so harsh on us when you're not that harsh on yourself. That's called hypocritical if you didn't know the English word for it. I'm not going to try to find an Arabic word for it. So many among men do not believe. This is saying that the majority of humanity do not and cannot accept faith. One more. That's not what it's saying. It's saying yet people are not fully or sufficiently faithful. It doesn't say yet many or most among men, humans do not believe. It's saying many are not sufficiently akthara. See, kathir. They're not sufficiently faithful. They're sometimes in their faith. Lastly, from Surah 7, Ayat 187, they ask thee about the final hour. See how they put final in brackets? Allah never said final. <laughs> when will be its appointed time? Say, the knowledge thereof is with my Rabb. None but he can reveal as to when it will occur. But isn't that still saying that he can reveal as to when it occurs? Even if it's none but he, it still says he can reveal it to whomsoever he pleases. My commentary. 
heavy were its burden through the heavens and the earth. Only all of a sudden will it come to you. They ask thee as if thou wert eager in search thereof. Say, the knowledge thereof is with Allah. But most men know not. They're saying most men don't have knowledge of this, but don't have knowledge. When it's actually saying, and yet the people do not fully understand. See, the Akhthara is not talking about the people. The Akhthara is talking about the knowledge that the people are not fully understanding what is being said here and taught here by the prophet about the hour. They understand some of it. They could understand a majority of it, but they're not fully understanding it. And how do we know that? Because of the responses in their behaviors. Now let's bring that on up to modern times, 2022. Are we fully understanding what's being said here? And if we are, and we know that the hour, whatever that is, could come all of a sudden, are we doing what we're supposed to be doing on a daily basis to secure our position, inshallah, so that Allah will be pleased with our actions and our thoughts and our behaviors? So don't look all the way out there about what all those other people are doing. The Christians ain't going to make it and the Jews ain't going to make it and the Buddhists and the Hindus. And none of them are going to make it. But, but what have you done to secure your place in gender? What am I doing on a daily basis in my relationship with my wife and children and friends and associates? And what am I doing to secure my position? You think it's enough that I'm just teaching you and that's going to get me into gender? You're wrong. Ain't no scholar going to Jannah because of what he knows or she knows. Why would that be right? When I could, I could record. As a matter of fact, I the bulk of what I've taught in the last 20 years, I have it on recording. So then the recording should make it into Jannah because it's saying exactly the same thing I'm saying. And sometimes in stereo and with some underlying bass tones attached to it. My recording should go to Jannah if it's just the knowledge content that will get you into gender. What am I the person doing for another person? Irregardless of their ethnicity or their gender or their weight in their, or their geography or their language, irregardless of that, have I found a way? Am I searching for a way to help other people out of their misery or just into a better semblance of life? What am I doing? Am I giving to charities? Am I being charitable? Am I actually literally getting up off my rusty dusty, going into the community, looking for who needs help? The veteran on the side with one leg in the wheelchair. Am I just, I know he's going to be there. I, let me just keep driving. And, you know, if he's there next time, it's too much, too much work for me to go in my back pocket to get my wallet. It's too much. He gonna be there tomorrow. Oh, really? You know, how do you know you're gonna be there tomorrow? Do what you can do while you can do it and ask Allah to give you the wisdom to be able to fulfill what Allah asks of you to do. When the opportunity avails itself for you to do it, that's how you earn Allah's grace and blessings and mercy. So with that said, I thank you all for indulging me for these three or so hours. I thank uh, <clears throat> our instructor, William Safir for opening up for us. If you missed that beginning, uh, and I have you in my, oh, well, this will, inshallah, I'm gonna put this up on YouTube. If it's not up tonight, inshallah, uh, about first thing in the morning, you'll see it, it has to cook, as you know. And um, thank you once again, for those whom I haven't spoken to since uh, my son's funeral in New York. So we're back, we're not fully rested, but we're good to go. Life goes on and we give that attention to living things and we don't do what the ancient Egyptians do and worship the dead.
lot that I'd like to say about that. But the way we bury our dead is from ancient Egypt. It's not from the Quran. I'm talking generally people, Americans, this part of the world. We bury people according to the standards set in ancient Egypt. And that goes from the embalming. That's an ancient Egyptian practice. That's not what Muslims are supposed to do. To the way we bury them, the way we cross the arms, you know, that's the Osiris thing with the staff and the flail, you know. So all of these things are practices out of ancient cultures, ancient religions, and we will slowly but surely return all of it to Allah's fitwa in time. But let's start with our own individual thoughts and behavior. So with that said, let me just see uh, a couple of people said a few things in the chat. Let me see if there's something that I need to answer. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, sir. Bashir Muhammad says, actually, Hank Ballard of Hank Ballard and the Moonlighters wrote and performed the twist. Go ahead. <laughs> Later, Dick Clark enlisted Chubby Checker, financed, then covered the song and dance routine. Rumor has it that Chubby Checker's, Chubby Checker's name, so I'm trying to see this without my glasses, that his name was a record label invention a twist on the ever popular Fats Domino. Domino versus Checker, got it. Both game names and Fats versus Chubby. I, I got it, okay, oh, man is on the case. Thank you for that, Rashia. See, we guys, boy, we got some whips in this group, boy, I tell you, people are right on it. And uh, Habiba says, Imam W.D. Muhammad told us to use our own minds, indeed. Tadar, Tadar, I hope I'm pronouncing it correct. Wazir said, the book, The Secret Life of Plants, proved that all cells communicate at the cellular level. There was a video on it, and Stevie Wonder did a two-album recording with that title. Yes, sir, I have it. And there is a video on that. Water consciousness has proved that water has a conscience, a conscious, and can read our minds. That is how things are passed on in our DNA, inshallah. You need to come on next week and do 10 minutes on what you just gave. That's beautiful. I love teachings on water. Yes, sir. Uh, the um, the books uh, the books by uh, Emotu, I forget his full name. You'll probably remember. Dealing with water and uh, the semi-freezing of water after repeating certain words in the glass of water and then freezing it. If you say positive words, then very beautiful crystalline features form. And if you say negative words into the water, then very distorted and misconfigured shapes from the same water once it's frozen. So that tells you that there's a vibration and energy frequency in water. And if the human being is 75, 85% water carrying around all of these negative words and language, then imagine the damage that you're doing to your cellular structure is damage taking place to your cellular structure because the majority of your body is liquid, it's water. So we'll go into that further down the line, but thank you for that. And I think that was the last comment, yes. So thank you for those and thank you for the corrections. And uh, we continue to move on. This is beautiful for very soon. And I know it will be within the first six months of this year before July, June, July, and so forth, July, August, the latest, we're gonna have some of you uh, instructors, and I don't mean just the senior instructors, some of you learners are ready to teach your own classes. You got Bashiali and all those, I, I look at their writings online and on Facebook and these other platforms, Instagram and that, and y'all are making a lot of sense. So I know Allah is sending the help, but I'm telling you those who have been really, really attaching themselves to this language, although you've been quiet for the past year, two years, three years, I know you're about to come out stampeding. I know it. I know it because you can't hold in the amount of information that you've been learning. 
And I know you're learning it because when I speak to you individually, I hear it. I could name at least 15 of you who are ready right now to teach your own abbreviated courses. So those are the things I will be talking about to you as I speak to you one-on-one. -on -one. And I'll be calling you one-on-one -on -one again, beginning tomorrow. So thank you. Have a good night's sleep. And inshallah, we'll meet again on this Sunday, 7 p.m. webinar. Thank you. As I greet you in the greetings of peace that obligate each and every one of you to keep that peace, the peace we began with that gives us calmness. Salam. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. Alaikum salam. Alaikum salam. You guys are the best. You're the best. Thank you. And thank you to any new people who joined us. We had close to 50 people a day. Any new people who joined us, thank you. You'll be receiving this as a replay webinar very soon or on uh, YouTube more than likely by the morning, inshallah. Thank you. You know. All right. Come on, Mark.